Fantastic inflation was the Bush family in America. Prescott Bush, the uh, boy Bush's grandfather, he um, was a major executive in a, a company called the Union Banking Corporation, which was owned by the Harriman family, another one of these bloodlines in America. And it interfaced with um, the uh, banking and uh, steel uh, empire of a guy called Fritz Tyson in Europe, and they funneled money from the Union Banking Corporation in America through to Tyson, and he was acknowledged, of course, as one of the major funders of Hitler, because the money came from America. Um, and uh, the Ernst Rudin, uh, Hitler's race purity expert, um, had a whole uh, floor of a, a German university for his research paid for by the Rockefeller family. There are no borders with the Illuminati. They, they just do what's necessary to bring about the problems that they can offer the solutions to. And as a result of the Second World War, of course, the world changed fantastically um, everywhere. Now, there's another version of it now called No Problem Reaction Solution. Example, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, where you don't need a real problem, you just need to sell the perception of one, like global warming and Al Gore. Uh, by the way, there's one thing I've learned over the years about Al Gore, many things I've learned, but one key thing. If Al Gore is involved, it's a scam. And <laughs> therefore, global warming's a scam. And when you start to uh, see that 31,000 scientists have now signed uh, a document saying there is nothing to justify the hysteria about global warming, um, you, you know you're starting to make some progress. Now, what we've had in America is a presidential version of problem, reaction, solution unfold before our eyes in the last few years. George Bush was brought in, only as a front man, to create massive problems with military excursions abroad and invasions and all the rest of it. And also, towards the end, right on cue of his presidency, massive economic collapse, which is far worse than they're telling because they have something else in store along those lines. Now, what they then did was bring in this man who came from nowhere, like Heli did, Barack Obama, a total con man who's um, involved with some real despicable pieces of work, not least a guy called Tony Resco, a slum landlord who's now in jail for fraud, who was one of his major fundraisers through his... Um, uh, political career and uh, he was brought forward and sold extraordinarily well to a gullible public as like the new broom sweeping clean they had the big smile and all the rest of it and um, his job is to come in because he, he he got elected because he wasn't George Bush I mean that you know anyone had a chance going against uh, after after eight years of Bush and his job is to sell the solutions to the problems that Bush uh, brought about. And those solutions, and we're seeing them by the day now, if you follow my website, headlines, etc., and others, um, as the agenda is introduced by this guy. Hope gnosis. Hope. What a waste of time hope is. It's like going round on a carousel horse hoping you'll catch up with the one in front, because hope's always in the future, isn't it? It's never in the now. I hope things will get better. I'm going to accept this shite now, because I hope things will get better. No, I won't change now, thank you very much. Buggy your hope, I'll have it now, thank you. Let's get moving. Um, so, he's got, he sold this idea, and he's, they did it brilliantly. It was a big mind control operation. If you notice, at no point in that entire year of campaigning against Hillary Clinton and John McCain, did he once um, give any detail about what he meant by uh, change, hope, and something to believe in. Nothing. So what they did was create a, um, an empty screen on which the people were projecting their version of what that meant upon him, so he became all things to all men and women. Because he represented what hope, believe, and, and, and uh, change meant to them, because he never articulated it. If he had, and he said, what I really believe is what he's doing now, he wouldn't have got elected. Change. It's all mind control. Look. You put, put it in the subconscious, subliminal. Change, change. Don't say anything. As the Nazis said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Adolf Hitler. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Exactly the same thing was played. If it works, why change it? 
I found this, uh, I, thought, I thought this was very appropriate to Obama. The wolf found that shepherd's clothing worked even better. It's what it is. He's a fraud. He's a fraud and a shyster on every kind of level you can imagine. Um, and, and the people that have brought him to power are um, people from one of the most corrupt political systems in the world, Chicago. And if you're not corrupt or acceptable to the corrupt, you have no way of making progress politically in Chicago. This guy soared from nothing because he represents the same cabal that the Bush family did. One of his handlers or mentors and key advisors on foreign policy is Sabigniew Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's security, national security advisor, who admitted a few years ago in a Paris Magazine interview that as uh, doing that job with Carter, he funded and trained freedom fighters in Afghanistan to undermine the cabal government um, that was then controlled by the Soviet Union. And he let the Soviet Union know that he and America were doing it to try to entice uh, the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan to give them, in his words, Brzezinski, their Vietnam. Eventually, they, they, they bit and they invaded as you remember, Afghanistan, and a million Afghans died as a result of that invasion. He saw no problem with that in the interview because it weakened another superpower. No empathy. Actually, is the Mujahideen, and then he, he brought, and, well, the people that followed him brought, the, the uh, Reagan Bush administration, brought uh, over a front man called bin Laden from Saudi Arabia to front up the Mujahideen and their resistance to the uh, Soviet Union occupation and eventually they became the Taliban and what is now claimed, although it's a major, major uh, exaggeration, uh, Al-Qaeda. And ironically, he's come to power with his backing and mentorship and uh, he's now massively increasing the number of troops in Afghanistan because he wants to beat the Taliban that started out from this guy in terms of the uh, um, the violence that has followed. He is a CIA frontman. No wonder they haven't found him. And, and Brzezinski is obsessed with this part of the world, he calls Eurasia, around the Caspian Sea where there's massive gas and oil reserves. And look who's around there. Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, which America wants to start um, a real conflict uh, there, which leads into China because they want a third world war involving China, Russia, Europe and uh, America. And all these other countries are all in this area, which Brzezinski has been writing about for years, calls it Eurasia, and he says you have to control that, basically, if you're going to control the world. Here is one of the major Illuminati frontmen of the last 50 years. Mr. Change has just appointed him an advisor. And then, a few weeks ago, the National Security Advisor to Obama, James L. Jones, an official position, I spoke at this conference on security policy um, in Munich and he says this about someone who's just a backroom kind of advisor, Kissinger. Thank you for that wonderful tribute to Henry Kissinger yesterday. Congratulations. As the most recent national security advisor of the United States, I take my uh, daily orders from Dr. Kissinger, filtered down through General uh, Brent Scro Scrowcroft, who's a, a, an underling of Kissinger, and Sandy Berger, who is also here. We have a chain of command in the National Security Council that exists today. So, how many people in America know that Kissinger is controlling um, foreign policy? And, and, and national security. Now this guy Brzezinski, uh, Obama's kind of uh, mentor and control figure, created this organization called the Trilateral Commission with this infamous reptilian bloodline, uh, the Rockefellers, that guy David Rockefeller, and uh, he's now a major player in Mr. Change's administration. Now this is where the Trilateral Commission fits in. It's a series of organizations around, oh, around um, this secret society, the Round Table, which was created in Britain in the latter part of the 1800s. Uh, and its first head was a guy called Cecil Rhodes. And over the years, these different organizations have been added to this network. The Trilateral Commission in 73, that one, Royal Institute of International Affairs, 1920, Club of Rome, the environmental manipulation arm of this uh, 
uh, Network in 1968, Council on Foreign Relations 1921, and of course the United Nations after the Second World War, and the Bilderberg Group in 1954, officially anyway. And these work as one unit to manipulate this agenda of centralization of global power and the surveillance society. To show you where Mr. Change's policy provider is coming from, this is what Brzezinski wrote in 1970. The technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. 1970. And it's happened. Why has it happened? Because it was the agenda way back then and before that it was going to happen. So we think Obama's uh, in control as a president, but it goes through him to Brzezinski and many, many other people in the cartel around him, and to a person here called George Soros, the infamous uh, global financier who's a major, been a major funder of his uh, campaign. <clears throat> this might get controversial, I don't care, needs saying. Um, around Obama, is the most extraordinary network of Zionists. And this is a key one. He's White House um, Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel. He's an American citizen, but he served in the Israeli army. And his father was a member of a terrorist group called Ergun that helped to bomb Israel into existence in 1948. Now one thing I want to make clear here, because this is lost in the translation on purpose. Zionism and Jewish people in general is not the same thing. What they want is for us to believe that so that in talking about Zionism, which is a political system and a political belief, is the same as talking about Jewish people. It is not. And how many, how many have seen the number of Jewish people who oppose Zionism. When do you ever see that on the news? Who don't believe it's right and don't believe it's part of, of, of Jewish history and all the rest of it. Then it's never seen. What's sold to us is all Jewish people believe in Zionism. Rubbish! But because they've equated the two, then you get called racist when you talk about Zionism. I don't care. It needs saying it, and I'm going to say it. If people don't like it, we're racist, they can bugger off. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what Zionism is. It is a political system created not by Jewish people, but by the Rothschild family. It used to be the Bauer family, until it became the Rothschild uh, banking dynasty, uh, created by a guy called Mayer Amstel Rothschild in the 1700s, early 1800s. And... They created Zionism, not for Jewish people, and a homeland for Jewish people, but as a means of creating this agenda, by creating constant conflict in the Middle East. Now, they paid for the Knesset, the uh, Israeli parliament building, built by the Rothschilds. Most of the early settlers of, uh, uh, from Europe into uh, Israel, or Palestine as, uh, as it was, was paid for by the Rothschilds, all part of the game. It was the Rothschilds who paid for the um, Israeli uh, Supreme Tel Aviv Supreme Court building, um, which is um, full of esoteric symbols, Illuminati symbols. And no one has been had more in this scam than Jewish people in general who've been led to believe that Zionism means one thing when it's going to hang them out to dry. In fact, Zionism and its... Uh, political belief system under different names in the past or no names has hung Jewish people out to dry so many times through history to, to advance an agenda. These people can't give a damn about Jewish people. They just use them as a front to hide behind. Because the Rothschilds aren't Jewish in that sense at all. They're one of these hybrid bloodlines which infiltrate all peoples. So Rahm Emanuel is the 
is a massive manipulator and controls Obama's every thought. And alongside him in the White House is a guy called David Axelrod, another Zionist, extreme Zionist, I'm talking here, who ran the entire election campaign for Obama and now dictates what appears in words on his autocue screens, his teleprompter screens. If you see Obama right from, the, right from the election campaign to today, he never looks straight there. He looks there, he looks there. He looks there, he looks there. Where, whatever he's doing. And the reason he's doing that is because either side of him are teleprompter screens with the words that he's reading. And these words are written by, or overseen written by, David Axelrod. He is so welded to these teleprompter screens, because he appears to be an intelligent man, but he's just an actor, that on St. Patrick's Day this year, Obama thanked himself for inviting everybody to a St. Patrick's Day gathering because someone else's script had been left on the teleprompter screens when he went up to read. He's now known by more and more people in America as the teleprompter president. And he's reading other people's words. Now one of his major funders, who raised about half um, a million dollars for his election campaign, is this man, Louis Sussman, extreme Zionist, who was vice president of Citigroup, which was Zionist, who was vice president of Citigroup, which was one of the major players in creating this economic crash in America. He, he's resigned about a month ago, and puppet Obama has now appointed him, or is in the process of appointing him, United States ambassador to London. This is an Obama who said, there will be no cronyism and giving good jobs for funding under my administration. So we're going to see no change in American support for the uh, appalling uh, events that happen in Gaza, the most crowded piece of land in the world. And in Israel now, we have a powder keg. We have real extremists in Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, Lieberman, the Foreign Minister, who's so far right he meets himself coming back, and this guy Barak, who's the uh, Defence Minister and was through the last regime when they were bombing innocent people in Gaza from the sky and burning their the bodies of children with white phosphorus. Now they want a battle, they want a fight, that's what they've been brought in for. And this guy, Martin uh, Van Creefeld, who's a, a, a well-known and a kind of top-notch military historian in Israel, said this, we possess several hundred atomic warheads and rockets and can launch them at targets in all directions, perhaps even at Rome. Most European capitals are targets for our air force, we have the capability to take the world down with us, and I can assure you that that will happen before Israel goes under. How many times have you had a discussion or seen a discussion on television or anywhere about the fact that um, Israel has a massive arsenal of nuclear weapons? Oh, we talk about Iran. They've not even got them yet. Can't, can't stop talking about it. Israel wouldn't even talk about it. No. Today, in fact, it was reported today, so it was yesterday, Barack Obama... Obama won't force Israel to admit it has nuclear weapons, official. US President Barack Obama's administration will not force Israel to state publicly whether it has nuclear weapons, an Israeli official says. He said yesterday Washington would stick to a decades-old US policy of don't ask, don't tell. Everyone knows they've got them, no one talks about it. World's fair, eh? This is what Zionism is about. Palestinian agreement, are you kidding? Never wanted it. The Greenland is what Palestinians uh, were settled in in 1946, 1947, 1967, 2000, and it's got smaller since. Look at that strip of land, most populated piece of land on the planet, Gaza. It's about driving people out, not making agreements with them. And all this stuff is all going on around this target area. What's that area like a, bar, like, a, like a hawk? Liar, liar. The great masses of the people will more easily fall victims to a big lie than a small one. Change. Hope. 
something to believe in. This is my Obama rule. Ignore the words and watch the actions. And his actions could be George Bush over and over again. Oh, this uh, shows that nothing's ever changed. There's Bono. There you go. There's Bono again. There you go. <laughs> Nothing ever changes. <laughs> Bono's got a shyster uh, kind of magnetic attractor somewhere in his being. I don't know how he does it, but he has. So this is the, the secret agenda I was talking about right at the top. And the movie, and of course uh, the Obama scenes in the movie were, crikey, really effective. This is how it's hidden. And it's come to money. Because the control of money and the creation of money is fundamental to controlling the people. And the Rothschilds are the biggest controllers of the money system on the planet. And what they've done brilliantly, at one time, everyone knew that. But they've brilliantly hidden the extent of their power, which has expanded, not uh, got smaller. But the perception of Rothschild control has, has disappeared compared with what it was, but it was on public display. <sighs> We don't ask big questions, uh, so here's another big question. Where does money come from? What is money? And when you ask that question, you find that it's just a figment of our imagination. Um, when you go into a bank and you ask for a loan, say $50,000, the bank doesn't print any money or move any precious metal anywhere. It just types into your account $50,000 and you start paying it, them interest on that money that has not, does not, and will never exist. Just credit, figures on a screen. Because the same network of families have controlled the politicians as have controlled the banking's uh, network, they have had legislation passed under something called fractional reserve lending that allows them to lend at least 10 times what they have on deposit. So every time you put a dollar in a bank, you're giving them the right to lend at least 10, 9, 10. Um, but it's far more than that in actual fact. That's the minimum it is. Um, and so uh, that's, what, that's how money comes into circulation. But like I say, it's more than that. So if I get 20,000, so, say I go into a bank and I, I ask for $50,000 and they give me a check uh, which represents figures on a screen that they've created out of nothing. I then go to another bank and I'll put it in another bank. That bank can now lend 10 times that $50,000, which has already been created out of nothing by Bank A. So now I write a check for, say, $20,000. I want to buy a car or something. And the person I buy the car off puts this $20,000 in his bank. This bank now can lend 10 times that $20,000, which comes from the $50,000 that this bank lent 10 times on, which was created out of nothing by Bank A. And so it goes on, round and round and round, as that non-existent money moves. And this is how the banking system works. And people are being thrown out of their homes for not paying back money that doesn't exist, never has existed, it's just figures on a screen. Third world debt is the same. And there's another thing. If you control the creation of money, then you control whether we have a boom or a bust. Because you have a boom when there's lots of money in circulation, uh, which creates economic activity. People need to buy more things, therefore make more things. There's more jobs and all the rest of it. You uh, push interest rates down and people take more and more loans out. And they get more and more confident because the, the, the job's doing well, the company's doing well, so they have another holiday in a bigger house and they borrow more money. But that's not a problem, they say, because you know, everything's going well. And then, at the optimum time, and we've just had it, they pull money out of circulation. Just figures on a screen. They pull them out. They'll push interest rates up or they'll um, uh, stop issuing credit. And what they're doing is taking money out of circulation. As they do that, there's not the same amount of money for the same economic activity that was there before, so people can't buy more things, so more things are not made and fewer things are made, so you have a depression. And these, the banks have been doing this for hundreds of years, throwing the fishing line out, more money in circulation, whoops, credit crunch, pulling it back in, and they're taking all the assets and what have you that um, they took in um, as collateral for the loans for non-existent money. And we've just had a massive version of that, <coughs> and it's not finished yet by any means. This man, Alan Greenspan, uh, all these um, 
illustrations like this, by the way, are by a man called David Deese, who's an American living in Sweden. He does fantastic political art. Um, Alan Greenspan was head of the Federal Reserve in America uh, from the uh, Reagan-Bush administration, through Father Bush, through the Clintons, through most of Boy Bush. And through that period, <coughs> regulation, financial regulation, was, was just destroyed. And eventually a free-for-all took place, and, it, and the consequences of that came just after, just by coincidence, Greenspan left the Federal Reserve, which is a privately owned cartel of private banks, uh, not the Central Bank of America as it's told. And so at the optimum time, towards the end of the Bush administration, they pulled the plug on this uh, boom, this credit boom, which had been manipulated and engineered to get right out of hand. And people will say this just quickly. People say, well, yeah, but all the bankers lose and all that stuff. Hold on. No, they don't. Some bankers lose. The people that own certain banks or run certain banks lose, but the people that control the system, they don't lose. If you, um, if you control the European Football Champions League, you don't care if Manchester United beat Barcelona or the other way around, because you own the game. You can't bloody lose. And these families own the game. They own the system. Therefore, if this bank goes down, that doesn't matter, because they own this bank and they own the system anyway, and it doesn't matter because they own the system. And, and that's what we need to understand to appreciate why if a few banks go down, it doesn't matter to these people, it can be very beneficial. So what they did was get people into debt while they were watching the football and having a beer. Oh, it's great, who's gonna win the Super Bowl? And oh, you go. And then they crashed it and all hell's breaking loose in America. It's far, oh, you go. And then they crashed it and all hell's breaking loose in America. It's far worse. I was there for two months early part of this year. I mean, there's tent cities in the bloody, in the bloody uh, cities. You know, it's like, you don't see it on the news very much, but there's tent cities. There's people who a few weeks ago, a few months ago, had what they call in America middle-class jobs. They were selling cars and doing all this stuff. Now they're living in tents. It's a catastrophe in America, and it's being hidden at the moment for, for reasons that I'll come to. So then they bring in this guy, Hank Henry Paulson, who was the chief executive and head of Goldman Sachs, um, until uh, 2006 and then became Treasury Secretary just in time to be the man that said the only way to, 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 to react to this credit crunch and all the catastrophe caused by the banks is to borrow vast amounts of money that the taxpayer will have to repay and give it to the same bloody banks that caused the problem including Goldman Sachs while he was chief executive. And so all this money's now been poured at the banks, trillions, and it has changed nothing. They're hiding the fact that it's changed nothing for now, but not for much longer. So then we had this difference. Here we have Bush justifying this throwing money at banks. Um, I won't read it all because I want to get through because <coughs> time is short <coughs> with all that I want to get through. <coughs> but one of the things he said to people on a television broadcast, if you own a business or a farm, you will find it harder and more expensive to get credit. More businesses would close their doors and millions of Americans could lose their jobs if we don't give trillions of dollars, billions in his case, it became trillions, to the very banks that have caused the problem. And then we had a change of presidency. And everything changed. And Mr. Fake said, economists from across the spectrum have warned that if we don't act immediately, millions more jobs will be lost and the national unemployment rates will approach double digits. More people will lose their homes and their health care and our nation will sink into a crisis that at some point we may be able, unable to reverse. Reptilian brain, oh, do it, do it. Except that large numbers of Americans has, are, are, are not happy with them doing it because times are changing and people are getting wise to a lot of this stuff. Again, be afraid, be very afraid because we've now invented the monster. It's called the credit crunch and fearing your financial future. And so what does Obama do? He then brings in to, his, um, to solve the problem the very people who caused the problem. There's a cartel of private banks, like I said, um, which um, constitute the Federal Reserve, which is officially the uh, Central Bank of America, but it's a private banks. Private banks, the most important one and influential one is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Decisions that they made fundamentally brought about this credit crunch that we're looking at. The head of the um, New York Federal Reserve Bank was Tim Geithner, 
What happened to him after the catastrophe he caused? Obama made him Treasury Secretary to decide how to react to the problem. He also brought in Larry Summers, who is the banker's boy, a man who in 1991 signed a memo when he was chief uh, economist for the World Bank, advising the World Bank to dump its toxic materials in third world poor countries because the cost of um, compensation for the death and injury that would follow would be less than in a Western country. Uh, Obama made him one of his key economic uh, people and Paul Volcker, head of the Federal Reserve for a long time before Alan Greenspan. Here we go. Two for the money. Bankers boys who helped to cause the problem are now uh, solving the problem. And interestingly, a few days ago in Greece, there was the 2009 meeting of the Bilderberg Group, in secret, of course. And um, there, because there's people now that um, uh, let certain real journalists have membership lists um, or attendee lists, in Greece, at this secret Bilderberg meeting, was Tim Geithner, Treasury Secretary of America, Larry Summers, another major uh, in the three uh, of the economic team of Obama, Paul Volcker, the other one in Obama's economic team, and Robert Zolek, head of the World Bank. Every single one of these people are Zionists. Just a coincidence? Nothing to worry about. Why wasn't this in the paper? It should be a major story. What is America's whole economic team and the head of the World Bank doing at this Bilderberg meeting? What's being discussed? What's happening? Nothing. Now this is the game, pulling all this together. This economic situation is designed to go into three, in three stages. One has happened, one is happening, the other one's yet to happen. Stage one, you collapse the economy and you, you, you uh, cause a crisis. Stage two, you put people in who manipulated the crisis into the positions of power in government and they decide to hurl enormous amounts of money, trillions, at the banks who caused the crisis. The idea of stage two is this, to empty the guns in terms of response options of all the governments to this crisis. And once those guns are emptied, i.e. they can't borrow any more money to react to this crisis, and by the way, that's why this money is doing nothing. It was never designed to. They're going to go to stage three, which is to collapse the world economy even further when governments can't respond. Uh, they want an economic catastrophe. Um, of 1930s and then some proportions. And it's designed to do many things, but this is one thing it is designed to do. It is to justify the creation of the World Central Bank by saying, and indeed the world currency will come eventually in part of this, the only way of sorting out this global economic catastrophe is to have a new global structure based on a world central bank, i.e. the complete centralization of global finance. And people like Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of Britain, um, I'm sorry about that by the way, um, has even used the term, we need a new architecture of global governance. That's exactly what he's talking about. And they're using America to destroy America. They want to destroy America financially. My God, they're well on the way. They want to destroy it military. They're well on the way. Why? Because when you want a, if you want a world government that's going to be a world dictatorship, you can't have any more super superpowers. You can have super states like the European Union, which are answerable to you, but you can't have um, superpowers, countries that have the ability to say no militarily and financially to the world government. So what they're doing, and I've been saying this for years now, that this is what was happening, they are using America to destroy America. They're using America to advance the agenda, but in doing so, they're destroying America. And they want to um, absorb America into a North American Union, their version of the, uh, of the uh, European Union. So it really all, it's been starting for a long time, but 9-11 really moted it on, uh, which was, of course, an inside job, which I'll go into, uh, I'll go into in my books. But this is what, uh, in 1997, uh, Brzezinski said. Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, 
it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstance of a truly massive and widely perceived direct and external threat. War on terrorism. Jet fuel, that's a good one. This is, uh, these are buildings in other parts of the world. That one's not collapsing, it's actually the design. It, it leans like that, it's, it's design. Um, that have been subject to uh, infernos of enormously greater magnitude than the Twin Towers. Not one of them collapsed. Never mind, like a, explo a, a controlled demolition house of cards. It smells like bullshit. The official story of 9-11 has just left the building. When history repeats, do we notice? Hitler burns down the Reichstag parliament building, blames it on someone else, justifies a dictatorship, etc. Uh, this is um, uh, Donald Rumsfeld in 1983, meeting Saddam Hussein on behalf of the Reagan Father Bush administration to arrange for chemical and biological weapons to be shipped to Iraq from American companies to be used against Iran. Uh, this, these are, this is a report of um, uh, 19, uh, 2002, when this became uh, uh, to light in official documents, Donald Rumsfeld, the U.S. Defense Secretary, as he was at the time, and one of the most strident critics of Saddam Hussein, met the Iraqi president in 1983 to ease the way for U.S. companies to sell biological and chemical weapons, including anthrax and bubonic plague cultures, according to newly declassified U.S. government documents. And what do they then say when they've created the problem? We must invade Iraq because Assad and Hussein has chemical weapons. Another coordinate method of manipulation, the totalitarian tiptoe. This is a good one. You're at A, you know you're going to Z. You know if you go in too big a leap, then the change is going to be so big in society that people are going to look up and say, what's going on? So you go from A to B, then to maybe D. You go as big as you can, but not big enough to cause too much of a reaction from the people. And uh, in all areas of our lives, um, this totalitarian tiptoe, as I call it, has been going on. I love this. Fascism, you really think it will be this obvious. It's being done in increments. But those increments have got so far down the road now that in many countries it is becoming more and more blatant and obvious. And it's the totalitarian tiptoe that allowed this to go from a free trade area to a centralized dictatorship, which is what it is today. Now what we have are endless religions, but when you do the research, they're actually worshipping the same force. Guess what that is, I wonder. Um, when the uh, Atlantean, Lemurian, New period um, had this movement of peoples, they took this religion and it, it manifested in many different forms. And it was a religion based on the s worship of the, the sun and the moon, and also the serpent, but the sun and the moon. And... Um, these different uh, early states of the old world um, started to uh, manifest these religions, but they were based on the same basic theme. And this area, again, our old friend from earlier on with the bloodlines, I call the religion factory. Because out of here came Judaism, came uh, Christianity, came Islam, came um, Hinduism, and so on, others too. Uh, and that's no accident either, based on the sun and the moon. Uh, and it's interesting, this is uh, an original uh, depiction of the sun and moon uh, goddess, uh, the moon goddess and the sun god, from Ur, which is now in, of course, um, in uh, what we call Iraq. And there's the international symbol of Islam. It's no accident. It may not seem to be a sun and moon religion, but it is. Uh, that Basically, they all come out of that. Uh, wherever you go, again, sun god again, moon goddess, it comes over and over and over again. Uh, this is the, uh, the sun depiction, and you see the moon as well, in um, uh, architecture of the Mormon church uh, in uh, America and around the world. It comes up again and again. And one of the great foundations of all these religions came from this, from Babylon. This is why we have Babylonian symbolism all around us without realizing it. This was the Babylonian trinity. Babylon, of course, followed Sumer in this same area of the world, Mesopotamia, now Iraq. 
Queen Samirimus was the, um, the goddess figure in the Trinity, also known as Ishtar or Ishtar. And uh, Nimrod, also known as Baal or Bel, was the sun god. And then you had Tammuz, he was the virgin born son of the Babylonian Trinity. This is long before Christianity. And so what you had was Queen Samirimus and Nimrod stroke uh, Tammuz, who were the, the same uh, person really, because what they said in Babylonian myth was when Nimrod, the sun god, died, he became the, 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 the sun god Baal, and he impregnated Samirimus with the rays of the sun, i.e. the virgin birth, thousands of years before Christianity, and she gave birth to Tammuz, the virgin-born son, who was the reincarnation of uh, Nimrod, therefore father and son were one. I've heard that somewhere else. And when the bloodlines and the Babylonian church, in effect, relocated to Rome and became the Roman church, which is the church of Babylon relocated, that's why the holy days of the Babylonian church and the holy days of the Roman Catholic church are the same. They just call them different things. Um, they took all the attributes of Semiramis in Babylon, queen of heaven, virgin mother, all the rest of it, and they put all those attributes on Mother Mary. And they created a Christian trinity of the uh, father god, that was Nimrod, the uh, son, the virgin born son, that was Tammuz in Babylon, it became Jesus. And the third point was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, uh, that was symbolized as a dove, and that's what Samirimus was symbolized as in Babylon, as a dove. And you have Samirimus and Nimrod, that's also Isis and Horus in Egypt. This is the same recurring story. The, the mother and the uh, virgin-born son are all over the world. You know, people think it's just Christianity. It's not. It's, it's all over the world you find this recurring theme. It's in, in Central America and, and, and all over. And interestingly, you know, the, 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 the reptilian mother and, and the son it was an image that obviously the Ubaid people in Mesopotamia before Sumer used to think highly of and worship. Now, this was how Queen Samirimus was depicted on ancient coins. This is the goddess of the Illuminati religion. I've seen her somewhere before. Because the Statue of Liberty was given to New York by French Freemasons in Paris who knew what she really represented. Not liberty, but enslavement. The Babylon goddess. This is a mirror image of the Statue of Liberty on an island in the River Steyne in Paris. Because as the bloodlines moved up into Europe, they took all their symbols from Babylon with them and um, took them into, into France and then eventually over to America as the Statue of Liberty. The uh, goddess of the French Republic, again, same. The goddess Freedom on the top of the Capitol building in Washington, same. Goddess of Columbia, District of Columbia, same. And there you see in the, uh, in the Vatican, um, you see the, uh, the dove in the center, that's Samirimus in the middle of the sun, which is uh, Nimrod. I mean, why do they have all these old pagan um, symbols in all these ancient churches? Because it's, you know, the, the, the Christian story is just for the consumption of the believers. Sun and, God, uh, sun and um, moon worship. Now, Nimrod, Baal Bel, he was symbolized... Um, in Babylon as a flame or a lighted torch. That's why Queen Samirimis, Statue of Liberty, is holding a lighted torch. That's the flame of Nimrod. And she's standing on a symbol of the sun, though not many people know that until you see it from above. This symbolism is, is, is everywhere. This is a massive and exact replica of the flame held by the Statue of Liberty on top of the Pont d'Alma Tunnel, just above where Diana died in 1997. That's where people, as you see, still take their tributes to her. Nimrod was also depicted as the fish god, Oans, in Babylon. There's a, an original depiction. This is a uh, drawn a version of how they depicted him. And that's where that comes from. The mitre, it's the fish god, it's the fish uh, god, it's, it's uh, Nimrod, because it's the church of Babylon relocated. The obelisk is the penis of Osiris, or the penis of um, uh, Nimrod, uh, who was known, uh, the, the obelisk in Babylon was known as the shaft of Baal. Baal, of course, was another name for Nimrod, uh, because it depicts the bloodline. And we're back there to that golden uh, uh, stroke um, copper 
penis on the uh, the Kreno Mutwa necklace of the mysteries. It's all symbolic of this bloodline. <coughs> this is why they call aircraft Nimrod aircraft. <coughs> why do they name them after the god from Babylon? So these religions moved out of the same area, peopled the world, and the religions are there to keep the minds of the people limited and in conflict so that we look like that instead of looking like that and we get caught in mind again. In the end they all end up <coughs> with the same masters or part of the same structure. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the same with um, the New Age and all that stuff. I, I call the New Age the last cul-de-sac before the gold mine. Because when you're starting to re reject cr uh, traditional religion uh, and, and you're trying to find another meaning for life, you, 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 you might be in very great danger of sussing actually something they don't want you to suss. So they'll pull you into another cul-de-sac, which is the new age. Where well, they also worship Jesus under Sananda or somebody. So these, um, these religions are to keep us in mind and disconnect us from consciousness by putting us in rigid beliefs rules and regulations and they're worshipping the same gods same force and this is interesting this is saying energy flows where attention goes and when you focus on something you focus your attention again what you're focusing on real powerfully is your decoding system is you are focusing energy your energy upon that now worship is a very very powerful um, form of focus and so religious worship, when it really, you really kind of mean it, focuses enormous amounts of energy. Um, I, had a, I met, went to see a guy in about 50 miles south of Salt Lake City. It was Mormon country, to say the least. And he lives in this little valley area with loads of houses. And he's got this ethereal bean that works on in, in the ethereal energy field, which is just outside of visible light. And uh, he was telling me, he used to, he, he's one of these genius guys who um, uh, people like Lockheed call in when they've got a problem no one can solve. They call him in and away they go. But he, he's, he's one of these inventors. And he was telling me, he said, this ethereal machine works with ethereal energy. It will not work when the Mormon churches are, are, are full at the weekends and everyone's worshipping because of the energy being generated by those churches in the, in the, um, in the services because there's, there's so many in that little valley. So energy flows where attention goes. 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 It's an energy trawling. Because if something is symbolic of something, even if you don't realize it, what it is symbolic of draws that energy that you're, that you're using to focus on that symbol. And these religions are full of symbols that actually mean the reptilian gods, the reptilian entities, and people focus on them, not realizing that's what they mean, but by focusing on that symbol, these entities draw that energy. They're all worshipping the same gods. I mean, what an image for a religion, that torture. And that's another symbol that you find around, the brazen ser uh, serpent, as they call it. Religion is mind. They're mind constructs. That's why I said earlier, if you became conscious, there would be no religion. Because do you think consciousness worships itself as a, as a deity? No. It knows it's all that is. It doesn't need a religion. It is all that is. And of course, through mind constructs, they play the mind constructs off against each other. Um, and uh, it means that... Uh, They've got a massive vehicle for divide and rule, as we've seen through the years. And the idea is, and religions do it so powerfully to put people in this state and shut off the channels to consciousness. Another coordinate, the secret society network worships the same gods as the religions do. And they use the same symbols. The eye of uh, Ra from Egypt. The all-seeing eye on AOL, on CBS. Columbia Broadcasting. Columbia means the dove. Comes from a, the French word for, for, for dove is Columba. But in, um, uh, in Rome, they used to worship Semiramis under the name Venus Columba. Venus the dove, which was the symbol of Semiramis in Babylon. Um, and uh, the all-seeing eye um, here 
uh, in the Illuminati and on the, on the dollar bill. These are the same gods and symbols that they've manipulated religion to worship. So you have that rising sun on the 33rd degree of Freemasonry building there, and then you have the rising sun over that depiction in the Vatican in Rome. Um, I got into a Freemason lodge once in Boston because there was no one there. It was like the Mary Celeste. I just kept walking, got taking pictures and stuff. Um, and, and what I found was this, again, um, rising sun figure, which you find again and again. Outside this Boston um, uh, lodge, which is a very big one, was also a, a sun figure. This is the 33 degree supreme headquarters of Freemasonry. And again, it's in Washington, D.C., just down from the White House. And again, you have the rising sun um, of the um, Illuminati, the, the bloodlines. That's what you get above Downing Street, the Prime Minister's residence. Not only is it symbolic of the sun, they've got the rays of the sun coming from around it. That's the sun chair of George Washington, um, who was the first president of the United States and a high, high Freemason, like most of them have been. This is uh, NBC News, again, the same... Uh, feel the rising sun. This is the Boston uh, Freemasonic uh, Lodge outside. This is the mother lodge of Freemasonry in London. Uh, started, I think, in uh, 1717 or something like that, 1700s. And it was from here that um, Freemasonry was launched into what became the United States. Where did they put the mother lodge of Freemasonry? In Great Queen Street in London. Great Queen was one of the Babylonian names for Semiramis. They, they're worshipping the gods of Babylon and the, and the trinity of Babylon, so are the religions. So when we have Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia, which was much bigger than it is now, when, when, when um, the Europeans came into the uh, Americas, it was supposed to be named after the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I of England. No, it wasn't. It was named after the Virgin Queen of Babylon, Queen Semiramis. So you have the pyramid structure of um, the secret societies, and as you go up, they tell you things and reverse what they told you further down. And so it's basically a pyramid of ignorance. And even at the top levels, they're not really the top levels. They're only the official top levels. Um, so the way they've structured society is just like a secret society structure. In, in levels of awareness, and only the people at the top know how it all fits together. It's the same in the secret societies. So like I was saying, you have the... Uh, secret societies we know about, Knights Templar, Freemasons, etc., but they um, feed out of their official peaks, the chosen ones, uh, overwhelmingly by bloodline, into the Illuminati levels, which don't officially exist, and that's where the real action is. That's where the real knowledge goes on, and even that's fiercely hierarchical. Why? Because the reptilian brain is fiercely hierarchical and obsessed with hierarchical structures of power. Now you can also uh, see this and symbolize this in terms of a spider and a spider's web. The spider in the center is the inner, inner sanctum of the global manipulation, well away from the eyes of, of the public. Each of these strands in the web represents a secret society or an organization that is ultimately answerable to the spider. The closer you are to the spider, the more exclusive and secretive the secret society is until you come out um, further and you reach the organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, which it's to some level interact with um, society. The Bilderberg Group's a bit further back, but they interact with society. But still they are ultimately answerable through the hierarchy to the spider. That, one, that level calls the shots and um, coordinates and dictates the global agenda. And that's what it's done to the world. The Jesuits um, are close to the spider, started by Ignatius uh, Loyola, the Society of Jesus, and uh, Adam Weishaupt, who was the official uh, head of the Bavarian Illuminati, which was uh, very active at the time of the French Revolution, etc. Um, people get confused, the Bavarian Illuminati being the Illuminati. The Bavarian Illuminati is one of the strands in the web, the web that I call the Illuminati. 
So the Jesuits uh, connected again into the Church of Babylon, Rome, um, is, is near the spider, and uh, the head of the Jesuits is called the Black Pope by researchers, and he's far more powerful than the real one, the current one there. Uh, you've got the Knights Templar, which has been made famous in more recent years by books by Dan Brown and Holy Blood, Holy Grail and stuff. And the Knights of Bitola and John of Jerusalem, who are now called the Knights of Malta and other names, they go back to the uh, 1100s and uh, just before, before the time of the Crusades, uh, right through to the present day. And again, they connect into the Roman Church, the Church of Babylon. Um, and it's the Knights Templar who are the prime force that manipulates the city of London, one of the most influential financial districts on the planet. And how appropriate that the Knights Templar symbol, therefore, is held by the uh, reptilian figures as on the crest of the city of London. Now this, uh, next to the city of London, is the temple I mentioned earlier, where that um, reptilian figure was between the, uh, where the two areas of London meet. The temple in London is named after this Knights Templar temple that featured in the Da Vinci Code by... Uh, Dan Brown, of course, which has brought some of this stuff to, to light, and there's that um, reptilian figure where the two areas meet. But we've heard all this stuff, not just from Dan Brown and Holy Blood of the Grail, but so many offshoot books that are available, and good luck to people. But it's all based on the fact that the secret, that these secret societies like the Knights Templar and Opus Dei and Dei and... Uh, um, uh, the Priory of Zion are hiding is the bloodline of Jesus. No, it's not. It's the diversion. It's what I call the gin and tonic with a twist, a bit of truth and then twist it. And you take people off in the wrong direction. It's about bloodline and it's about secrets and it's about secret societies, some of which are those named in these books. But what it's about hiding is this, the reptilian hybrid bloodline and the way it coordinates, coordinates the enslavement systematically of humanity. Now, the um, Satanism connects into this. These bloodlines have been doing blood drinking human sacrifice to the gods, this reptilian gods, because when you do a human sacrifice, it releases tremendous amounts of energy, not least terror, um, from the victim, and that's absorbed by these gods. And even the Satanists on the physical level doing it drink uh, the blood which at the point of sacrifice is filled with adrenaline due to the terror that the ritual has caused in the victim and that's like nectar to these people. I mean these, these people are not like <laughs> most people. Um, and it connects into um, the secret society network. I'm not saying everyone met, member of secret society is a Satanist, absolutely not. We're talking about you know, inner enclaves but they do connect. And one of the things that they do, or very quickly before I say that, this is Vlad Dracul, after whom the Dracula books were, were based, that family. And he was um, obsessed with serpent and dragon symbolism. In fact, he was a member of something, his short version is, the Royal Court of the Dragon, which was created in uh, ancient Egypt to um, uh, put the dragon bloodlines into power. And he was uh, a leader in what is now... Uh, Romania and he was called Vlad the Impaler because he used to impale people on on um, spears and and just let them die and he used to drink the blood and dip his uh, bread in and everything it was infamous uh, for, for what he did grotesque um, he is um, like I say the man that Dracula was based on but um, he was a real person and Mary of Tech the grandmother of the present Queen of England uh, is a direct descendant of the sister of Vlad Dracul. Um, I wasn't surprised when I heard that, I have to say. So these things about satanic um, ceremonies and what they do to children and ch child abuse are unbelievable, what these bloodlines and their networks do. Um, and so when you go back through what we call history, um, human sacrifice and all the rest of it is common but we think we're in the modern world now, so it doesn't still go on. Yes, it does, but it goes on in secret now. But the same rituals go on. Um, if anyone saw a, a movie, the last movie of Stanley Kubrick, called Eyes Wide Shut, where there was this ritual in this uh, stately home in America and all the rest of it, that is absolutely spot on. 
what happened. And Stanley Kubrick, after he made that film, um, it was delivered to the film company and, and the executives watched it. And within a very short time, according to someone who's writing a biography of Kubrick, it was about an hour or so, he mysteriously dies of a heart attack. And what I know from the same person who's um, researching this for a biography, like I say, of Kubrick, is that um, the executives took 15 minutes out of that film um, for what was actually shot. That's why some parts of the film seem to jump. It's because they took 15 minutes out of it. Now, what the hell was in that when you see what was actually in it? Because it was so accurate, but mild, in terms of what these bloodlines get up to. And places like Bohemian Grove in America are becoming you know, more and more well known. People want to find out where the elite of America and further afield go and do their rituals and what have you um, every year. Uh, July usually and uh, so they're coming up not far now and there they um, in the 2,700 acres of Redwood Forest in Northern California the Bush family and the Bill Clinton and all these executives of the banking system and all the rest of it Kissinger they worship this 40-foot stone owl these people in um, in their gowns and everything and uh, Interestingly, Queen Semiramis, this is an original Babylonian relief depiction of the Babylonian god, goddess, also known as uh, Ishtar or Ishtar. She was um, uh, depicted as um, symbolically with the owl, connected to the owl. And when you look at the Congress building in America um, and you draw a line around the road system within the Congress complex, you've got an owl with a Congress in its belly which is uh, rather symbolic of the truth. And when you look at a street plan of Washington without doing anything to it, there's the owl standing on a pyramid with the Congress building in its belly. These people are obsessed with symbolism. And not just in America, this is the street system of Canberra, Australia, um, with the uh, Parliament building at the top Because symbols and geometrical symbols in certain places affect energy which affect the way people perceive reality. So these people, uh, Moloch there is a, an ancient um, god figure which is mentioned in the Bible to, uh, to whom people sacrifice their children. Uh, he was also symbolized as an owl. 40 foot stone owl at Bohemian Grove worshipped by people who make the decisions that run our world. Give you an example, um, this is Glenn Seaborg who um, developed plutonium. Cheers, Glenn. And um, this is a picture taken in 1957 at Bohemian Grove. And there is Ronald Reagan, then a B-movie actor. There is Richard Nixon, a career politician. Both members of Bohemian Grove both become presidents of the United States, although they come from vastly different backgrounds. Presidents are not elected by ballot. They are selected by blood and selected by the way that they can... Um, serve the agenda. The secret agenda is hiding uh, its uh, agenda through the movie, uh, but it's becoming clearer. Now, the super state agenda. Again, like I said earlier, if you're a few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. And so they want to turn countries into subordinate regions of the um, super states under the world government and extremely uh, relevant to uh, the European Union, of course, is Croatia. Now, everything fits into everything else if you keep talking for long enough on all this and keep researching for long enough. Twelve stars in a circle is the symbol of the Babylonian goddess. This is why they depicted Isis, who was another version of the Babylonian goddess in um, Egypt, with 12 stars around her head. And they depict Mother Mary with 12 stars around her head. It is the symbol of the goddess. How appropriate then that Europe is named after Europa, the goddess Europa, who is another version of Semiramis. And they depicted Semiramis Europa and Nimrod as a girl and a bull, riding a bull. Nimrod, Semiramis under the name Europa. The European Union in 2005 released commemorative coins with 
Europa and Nimrod on them. The European Union is not a political union. It is the union of the Illuminati goddess which they wish to enslave the whole of Europe within. And it's extraordinary to me that there is not a bigger debate in Croatia at a political level and others about this sleepwalk into tyranny that this country is embarking upon. In Britain now, 75% of the laws that are introduced come not from the British Parliament, but from bureaucrats in Brussels, not elected people in the European Parliament. They're irrelevant. They're just there to give the impression there's some democracy, which is another tyranny called control or domination by the majority. I don't think that's freedom, me. So as we are losing our sovereignty uh, and our ability to control our own lives within our own communities to the European Union, other people are saying, oh, I'll have some of that. Huh? They want to break Europe up into regions to de-unify in a unified response to the edifice of power in Brussels, and they've even produced the maps. This was one in a British newspaper. And what they do is they take parts of Britain and they put them in regions with parts of other countries. Again, de-unify. Now, here's an irony. The organization that orchestrated, in, in, in my books I go into this in great detail, uh, the organization that orchestrated the, the creation of the European Union was a organization called the Pan-Europa Movement, the Pan-Europa Goddess Movement, headed by, stands back in irony, the Habsburg Dynasty, symbolism in the middle. So here's Croatia, the Croatian government, who are leading a country that removed the Habsburg control, and now they're handing it back to them, and their networks that link into the Rothschilds, without a gun being fired. And what is about to hit this country when that document is signed, people have no idea. The whole way of life of this country is finished within a matter of years. There's the European Union, controlled by bureaucrats in Brussels, unelected. 500 million people. And there's Croatia, do you think it will have a say? Anybody think it will have an influence? And once you sign the document, the Croatia becomes subject to anything they decide in the bureaucracy. And I'm told, I'm not here long enough to be an expert, I wouldn't claim to be, I wouldn't uh, patronize you by saying I am, but from what I'm told, there's no debate worth the name going on in politics in Croatia between different political parties about going into the European Union. Well, they should be friggin' ashamed of themselves given what they're about to impose upon this nation and upon this land. Why? question I had last time I was here. Croatia's not in the European Union yet. What's the European Union flag flying on government buildings for? Because it's a done deal. To these people, you and the rest of the Croatian nation does not matter. You're just cattle. Just pawns in the game. Have a referendum and let them choose. Are you joking? They might say no. Now we talk about tanks and armies gathering on the border about to invade a country. Well, that's happening to Croatia now, except they're not tanks. They are piles and piles 
mountains and mountains of legislation, subclauses, triplicates, fine detail dictating how everyone lives their lives, what they can do and what they can't do, what the government can do and can't do. Because any law, once you're in, passed by the Croatian parliament that is at odds with a law decided by bureaucrats in Brussels, then the law passed by the Croatian parliament becomes invalid. See, Britain went into the European community, now the European Union, thanks to that guy Ted Heath I mentioned earlier, signed us in as Prime Minister. And I've watched the totalitarian tiptoe of more and more centralization, more and more legislation, more and more subclauses and regulations and rules building up and building up and building up year after year, month after month, decade after decade. And we kind of seen it happen right up to the present day. It's not been nice, but at least, you know, you've seen it happen. All of that is now piled up on the Croatian border. And all of that becomes the law that Croatian people must abide by and governments, companies, individuals, the moment those documents are signed. Tidal wave. That's what it is. A tidal wave of legislation of do's, don'ts, can'ts, musts are about to devastate the freedom of this country to make its own choices. And no bloody debate. They're doing the same in America. They're very, very close to introducing the North American Union. Well, they'll bring Mexico, the United States, and um, Canada under one government and with one currency. Working title, at least working title, is called the Amiro to pre replace the dollar, the Canadian dollar, and the peso. That would never happen unless there was economic catastrophe in America. Oh, there's economic catastrophe in America. And uh, during the Nixon administration, they produced a planned regionalization of the United States, just as they've done in Europe. And so as this moves on, we have now a name for it, globalization, which is the centralization of um, every area of our lives. It is the agenda I've been talking about for nearly 20 years now appearing before our eyes. And what we see with the protests and the left, and good luck to them with the protests and all that stuff, they protest against globalization, but they're missing such a point. Oh, please. This is not about big bad corporations being greedy. It is on one level, but the corporations are not the originators of globalization, they are the vehicles for it. And if all these different protest groups, protesting against war, protesting against um, uh, unfair trade, protesting against globalization would just realize they're all protesting against the same core force that's responsible for all of them. If we realize that, we might have just some chance of coming together. Because it's funny, not funny, aha, uh -huh, funny, uh, oh my God, that the left in politics are some of the most resistant to accepting that there is a global conspiracy. And one of the reasons for that is it means their whole world view has to change. Because it's not us and them anymore. It's that group which control both us and them. They don't want to move that. They want to hold on to the, the old paradigm of us against them, right against wrong, right against left, good against bad. Political correctness is part of it. This is a politically correct sign. I love this. Caution. This sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. Then at the bottom it says, also, the bridge is out ahead. You know, it's a crazy world we're living in. Um, so, programming the body computer, I'm going to go quickly through this because we, we need a break. Um, they know the body's a computer and therefore they know it can be programmed. The microchip, which I've been talking about and writing about for years, is now 
slowly but surely being introduced. We need to not accept that big time. Because, as I said in the first part of this presentation, um, they can have human computer interface uh, communication because they're com connecting to computers. Well, a microchip can affect a computer system, a biological computer system. Microchips are not just for electronic tagging, though that's part of it, so the computer knows where you are all the time. Once you get a microchip inside you, they can start to manipulate you externally, mentally, physically, and emotionally because they are affecting the body computer systems. Therefore, they're affecting electrochemically and, and uh, physically. And they're much smaller than this now. And like I say, this is what they want, barcoded people. It's all hypnotism to put us in the vibrational prison. Computer access. Well, the human form at one level is an electrochemical organism. To be optimum physically, mentally, and in terms of receiver transmission, connection, it needs to be in some sort of electrical chemical balance. If you destabilize that electrical chemical balance, you make it much less effective as a thinking, emotional, feeling um, receiver transmitter. And this is what shite food has done. You know, people say, oh, the American culture is everywhere. It's not. America is a mind control laboratory set up for that purpose. They try first in America what is most effective on suppressing the population mentally, physically, and emotionally. When it works, they export it to the rest of the world, and at that point we say American culture's everywhere. It's not. It's the mind control, physical manipulation, mental and emotional manipulation techniques that have shown to work in America that the rest of the country then physical manipulation, mental and emotional manipulation techniques that have shown to work in America that the rest of the country then gets. That's why fast food, soundbite news, and all the rest of it has come out of America. Um, I feel for Americans, because they really are um, at the forefront of this in so many ways. And all this stuff is designed to access the body computer and destabilize it. MSG, by the way, what is that? It's a flavor enhancer. What does that mean? It means tricking the brain to decode more taste than is actually there. They know how the bloody system works. All this, these drugs they give to kids and stuff, and, and so many, if not all of these people that are crazy with guns have been on this stuff. Aspartame, it's a, a, a brain uh, suppressor, a brain poison brought onto the market by Donald Rumsfeld when he was head of Cell Pharmaceuticals, sold out for a fortune to Monsanto. Fluoride in the water, used in the concentration camps to suppress the mental faculties of the inmates. Now put into drinking water to protect teeth. Doesn't protect teeth. It's an illusion, it's just an excuse. Frankenstein food, genetically modified food from Monsanto in St. Louis, one of the most monumental Illuminati companies on planet Earth that now is the supplier of aspartame. And the genetically modified food is designed to genetically modify us because DNA affects DNA. You are what you eat. And if we continue to eat what they're giving us, then my God, what we are going to be beggar's belief. Vaccines. I know it's like in Croatia, in Britain now, in America. Children, 18 months old, by the time they're 18 months old, they've had 25 vaccinations and combinations of vaccinations. There's a developing, forming immune system which is bombarded by poison on a staggering scale to protect the children from diseases that were in free fall before the vaccinations came in. Because we have an uh, we have a immune system which is designed to sort out these things if left to its own devices and if through good nourishment and good health, which the rest of this stuff takes away, we build to its optimum power. What we're doing is undermining every single young person's immune system in its 
very formation by bombarding it with this chemical shite and all this other stuff that's in vaccines and we're devastating immune systems and opening them up to other things later in life which a strong immune system would not have allowed to happen. Uh, my son, he's 16, this audience today, he's never had a vaccination in his life. Healthy as the day is long, he had a health um, uh, test a few uh, years ago, maybe two years ago, and the guy said, this is the you're the healthiest person I've ever tested. Never had a vaccination. His uh, mates at school were getting diseases they'd been vaccinated against, he wasn't. Now I'll finish with this and I'll be quick. The carbon con. This is so important because this is being used to sell so many uh, parts of this agenda. The idea that human caused uh, carbon emissions are changing the climate. Well, if, if pigs could fly, I would agree with it. Last time I looked, they couldn't. I'll go back to this network of organizations. One of them is the Club of Rome set up in 1968 to use the environment to uh, manipulate this agenda. Now I was a national spokesman for the British Green Party in the 1980s. I have no problem with protecting the environment to say the very bloody least. But that's not what this is about. In 1991 in a publication called The First Global Revolution of the Club of Rome, its founder, Aurelio Pecci, said this, in searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. And that's what they've done. Greenhouse effect. This is the idiot's guide. I saw this on the internet. I thought it was funny. Anyway, um, the idea is that because of uh, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which is a minute greenhouse gas, uh, the vast majority right up into the 90% of greenhouse gas is our water vapor and clouds. Let's ban them. The amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere uh, by percentage of carbon dioxide is minimal and the human element of that is a fraction of that and by the way without carbon dioxide we couldn't live on this planet there'd be no sod in vegetation but now it's the freaking enemy enter Mr. Scam Mr. Mr. Reptilian Hybrid Gore they must have been psychic when they named him Gore um, this guy um, has not only sold a monumental lie and refuses to debate, by the way, with scientists, 31,000 of which have signed a, a, a document saying there is no justification for this and, and, and no, nothing to support it uh, on the scale he's talking about. Um, but he is making a fortune out of this because he set up a company before all this came out with a, a guy called Blood, um, who from Goldman Sachs, of course, and um, it's known as Blood and Gore in the city of London, appropriately, and it sells carbon trading. And therefore, as, as Obama brings in this cap and trade carbon system, he makes a flipping fortune. And by, by the way, he and Donald Rumsfeld make a fortune when uh, people use anti uh, bird flu and swine flu drugs, especially one called Tamiflu. They make a fortune. Thanks for the Oscar, but I'm totally full of crap. Of course, he got the Oscar because he was designed to get the Oscar, to push this film, Inconvenient Truth, and sell the lies in it. And we have these concerts all around the world. And you know it's a scam these days because Madonna's singing on a stage about it, right? And they, 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 with these concerts to sell global warming, um, they produce this global warming survival handbook written by David de Rothschild, stands back in amazement. 
And what they're doing is they're selling an excuse for vast changes. First of all, there's a wonderful computer uh, truth, crap in, crap out. You put rubbish data in, you get rubbish data out. And what they're doing is putting su su suppositions about global warming and, uh, and uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions into their computer uh, programs, and they're getting out dire forecasts. Crap in, crap out. And it's about survival, survival. We've got young people at school now fearing about global warming and what's going to happen to them in the future, even as year on year at the moment, because of the cycle of the sun, temperatures are falling. And this is another big one. They're looking for excuse after excuse in global warming and climate change. By the way, they're calling it climate change now. Do you, do you, realize, uh, do you notice that? Because temperatures are falling year on year because the sun cycle, sunspot cycle is falling at the moment. Um, they, they turn global warming to climate change. Um, international law. They're looking for anything that can be uh, subject to international law. Why? Because if you want a global dictatorship, a world government, you need laws that everyone on the planet has to abide by, i.e. international law, and uh, global warming is a wonderful excuse for it. Um, this is uh, what uh, Gordon Brown and uh, his mate, uh, the leader of the Conservative Party in Britain, are saying, a new world order to save the earth on global warming. I think we need a new world order to save ourselves from Gordon Brown myself. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, because I noticed it since I got off the plane here two days ago. When the sun comes out, it gets warm, you know? Um, and when the sun's not out, it's not quite so warm. So I've worked out, because I'm clever, that earth temperature and the sun have some connection. <laughs> I've worked that out, right? And. And there are cycles, some of which are more powerful and less powerful, but there are cycles and there's some strange things going on now because we're in a low cycle that is really low. And it's, there are cycles of sunspot activity where the sun uh, emits these fantastic projections of energy known as sunspots, um, some of which are as, as big as Jupiter, most are as big as the Earth or bigger. And this is the recent cycle where they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then they, they wind down, there's fewer and fewer of them, and uh, that we've gone into the low side of it, and that's why temperatures have been falling and they've changed global warming to climate change. Um, and therefore, as these sunspots project this energy, this solar energy, and uh, it comes to, to this part of the solar system, things tend to warm up. That's the, uh, the, what goes on. And this is why, in this, the period where temperatures went up for a while, as part of the cycle, then temperatures always went, also went up on other planets. And um, it, it's kind of funny because David Rothschild was on the Alex Jones show in America and um, he was asked why if global warming is, um, on Earth is caused by um, human carbon emissions, why um, uh, the, the uh, temperature of Mars is also going up. And he said because Mars is closer to the sun than the Earth. So um, didn't get a good education uh, at that time, I have to say, with all that money too. Now, in the medieval warm period, as scientists call it, about 800 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or 1,000 AD, um, temperatures were much, much higher than they are today. So the question is, how did that happen? How could it be? Turbocharged hand carts? Is that what it was? Carbon emissions from hand plows? What was it? It was the sun, a sun cycle. And by the way, the medieval warm period was a time of great abundance. It, when it gets really cold, that catastrophe happens. Like when we went into the Little Ice Age, which followed the medieval warm period. And so many of the, it's the hottest temperature since records began. And you say, well, when did records began? And they go, 1800, 1800 and something. First of all, that's five minutes ago in Earth um, uh, climate uh, uh, cycles. And B, it's right in the bloody um, coming out of the Little Ice Age and earlier, right in the Little Ice Age. Of course it's a lot warmer now. Thank God for that. In the Little Ice Age, you still see this depicted in uh, Christmas cards in England uh, uh, every year. They used to have ice fairs on the River Thames because it froze so solid 
they had fares actually on the Thames. And then as we came out of the Little Ice Age, uh, sunspot activity started to increase and uh, temperatures increased. Stands back in amazement. And if we bring it up to closer to the present day, it continued. It went up, sunspot activity, to about 1940 and then went down to 1975. Earth temperature went up to 1940 and down to 1975 and then after 1975 it started to climb. And now it started to, over the last few years, go down again. But their repetition. Now I saw this guy, like me, this is no anti-environmentalist, he was a former advisor um, to Greenpeace and lead advocate for Greenpeace and he goes around now doing uh, presentations saying for goodness sake don't listen to them. And he points out, behind the scenes there's major disagreement among scientists. You don't hear about that because only those that say um, it's true get in the, in the news on any number. Parallel to carbon dioxide rising, the solar field has increased by over 200% since 1900 and this is not factored to computer models. The solar field has increased by 200%. Global temperature is not rising as predicted. In fact, it fell by a whopping 0.6 degrees over the last 12 months, as much as it had gained in the previous 50 years. Many of the apparently random fluctuations of past temperature, like when the Vikings grew crops in Greenland, correlate to variations in the solar electric field. Between 1983 and 2001, cloud cover, according to the International Satellite Cloud Tech Climatology Project, fell by 4%, more than enough to heat oceans and account for global warming. A spate of recent science shows that temperature oscillations are timed by solar cycles, that the jet stream is affected by the solar wind, and that past high and low points in the solar cycle correlate with past temperature swings. It's a scam. And just by repetition, it shows how powerful that is in programming the body computer that will, is not conscious and therefore can come from another perspective to accept whatever it's told. And temperatures, like I say, have been falling um, recently. This was in a, a, a national newspaper in Britain. Global warming could stop naturally for 10 years, say scientists. All right, but we'll still go on with all the international law. There you go. This is a guy, I won't go into this, but this is a guy who is the chief advisor to, to Al Gore on climate change and he's been exposed as fixing the figures, publicly exposed as fixing the figures when they didn't fit in terms of the temperature rising. And of course, Mr. Change, Mr. Fake, has appointed in his energy and environmental departments all supporters of Al Gore. What a surprise. And if you want to confirm it's a scam, there you go. Okay, breaking the spell, because that's what it is. Spell has been cast on the human mind to put us in a state of perception that is not the one that we would naturally have without the spell. It's a genetic spell and it's an energetic spell. And our natural state is one of harmony with the rest of this reality and harmony with the multidimensional self. But along came this schism, this energetic change, this genetic intervention, which took us from a state of harmony, this golden age, to increasing control of our sense of perception, which broke up this society into warring factions, not just warring factions within the society, but warring factions within ourselves, because most of us are at war with ourselves. We're at war between what we feel and what we think, what we'd like to do and what we think we ought to do, what is our perceived duty and what our free spirit, where that would like to take us. It's a schism on every level. And the more that we are divided within ourselves and between ourselves, the more easy we are to manipulate and control. And so much of it, the prime level of it, is through the manipulation of the reptilian brain and its primitive emotional responses and its survival mechanism, which is based on fear 
and surviving in so many different ways, not just physically. I mean, the, the reptilian brain does fear because it's fear that activates its survival mechanism on so many levels and, and its survival responses like fight or flight. When uh, we say rightly that fear is the weapon that is most used to keep uh, humans in line, yes, that's true, but, uh, but what part of us is activated through fear so that we respond in the desired fashion? The reptilian brain. It's through the reptilian brain that we get insecurity feelings, emotional insecurity. Again, it's a form of not surviving. It's amazing how this uh, survival sense manifests in so many ways. You know, when we have, uh, let's start with that one, when we have religious beliefs and they are challenged, that too activates the reptilian brain survival mechanism because survival of the belief system is at stake, is under challenge. And so you get primitive emotional responses when religious rigid beliefs are challenged by information or other views. Same with pol political views, even political views. When you um, are having them challenged, the reptilian brain kicks in because it's the belief system is under threat of not surviving. Same with uh, race and self-identity. When we have this self-identity, this is who we are, when that comes under challenge, again, the self-identity is in danger of not surviving and the reptilian brain impulses are kicked in. It's the key way that we are controlled and the way that we defend rigid uh, belief systems and therefore rigid uh, ways that the brain fires off and reads reality and mostly puts us in a prison, a vibrational prison. And often because we feel more secure in the sense that our belief system is right, belief system is right, more secure if our sense of self is what we believe we are, we go into these little comfort zones. And these comfort zones are prisons, but they don't activate the reptilian brain emotional responses, so we feel comfortable. I feel comfortable saying that I'm a Christian. I feel comfortable saying that I'm this or I'm that. I feel comfortable in my little comfort zone. And when we're breaking out of comfort zones, i.e. we're breaking out of a sense of limitation to all possibility, this is kicking in all the time. Because something else that's now um, in danger of not surviving is the very mind-body uh, system itself. So this is always telling you, the reptilian brain, why you shouldn't break out and follow your heart. Oh no, you've got a mortgage, you've got a family, oh what will your mother think, Ooh, Survival, 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 fear, fear, fear. And another way that we, like I said earlier, defend these belief systems that keep us in the box is by lying to ourselves and not being honest with the fact that actually the belief system doesn't stand up to this information. And instead of saying, I'm going to make it so, if we say, okay, I'm going to move my belief in the light of this, then we can start to move and break out of the boxes. Because cognitive distance is a form of schizophrenia, where two, two parts of self are thinking different things or are seeking to hold two belief systems at the same time, like double think, almost double think. And again, you've got two areas of self at war with each other. One that is trying to defend the belief system and other levels of self that know that there's a, there's a problem with that and again it's another war. We're not whole people. So the question is, in terms of where we go, is are we going to be consciousness or mind? Are we going to be all that is or little me? Because little me, the mind loves little me. He can get on with little me. But it can't get on with all it is because he doesn't perceive that that's who we are. It believes that it is who we are, the mind. And if it kids us to believe the same, then it's got us. So we can uh, go on following the mind, little me, 
and we'll go on living the lives that we've lived and we'll go on creating the world that we've created, this mind-made world. And on one level, because the reptilian brain's going to be telling us this, survival, survival, um, it's much easier if you just go with the flow and go with the mind and don't make waves and just carry on as you are and, you know, don't cause any trouble, keep your head down, everything will be fine. And that's what we've done for thousands of years and that's why we live in the world that we do. And we're facing now the opportunity and the challenge to get that get that under control, to put that in a place of subordination instead of it being the governor of our reactions, our governor of our perceptions and the governor of our fear mechanisms that hold us in servitude. And to do that we need to move our awareness to the fact that we are consciousness and live the fact that we're consciousness. And this will scream like hell because when you start to move into the realm of consciousness and express that in this world, you start to live lives and express views and do things and talk about things that are completely at odds with mind-made society. And you get ridiculed and you get marginalized, you get called dangerous, you get called crazy and all these things because to mind, you are crazy. It doesn't understand about unity and all that is. It only knows about division and apartness. But this is vital that we do this and get this under control, get this out, the, out of the driving seat. Because as Einstein said, you cannot solve problems with the same level of consciousness that created them. And that's what we've been trying to do right through this human cycle of experience. In politics, we remove a political party that has a certain level of consciousness and has created mayhem as a result and we vote in, if we're lucky, um, another political party that operates on the same level of consciousness as if that's going to change anything. It doesn't, it just continues. All these things that are happening in the world that we want to find solutions to, we're trying to find solutions to them at the same level of consciousness that created the problem. Impossible. Round and round here we go again. We have to move to another level of consciousness, otherwise nothing can change because our level of consciousness is expressed in the physical holographic world that we decode and will always do so. Only when our level of consciousness expands and rises itself, raises itself, is the um, holographic world that we therefore create from that level of awareness going to change from the one it is now. We have to change for the world to change. So Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That's what happens when consciousness never changes. It keeps doing the same thing because that's all it knows because that's its program of reaction. Nothing changes and we go round and round and round and we need to break that cycle. Badly break that cycle as a collective and individual uh, expression of all that is. It's no good saying we are consciousness, and it's a challenge for all of us, me included, but it's no good saying we are consciousness uh, and, and having it as some kind of intellectual concept. Yes, I'm consciousness. Yes, I shall write it down in triplicate. And then live in the box. We are, if we are consciousness, then we express ourselves as consciousness. We don't live in the box because the, you, you can't be conscious and live in a box. And the idea is to create those vibrational boxes so that we don't uh, become conscious and the level of consciousness doesn't change so nothing out here can change. The whole foundation of this conspiracy is to hold us in low levels of consciousness and awareness, mind, and therefore keep this cycle going round and round and round because nothing can change unless our level of consciousness changes. And it's not that these manipulators are some all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful beings. They're not. They're pathetic. They're on very low levels of awareness, but they are on a higher level of awareness than us because through manipulation genetically and energetically, they have simply put us in a smaller box than they're in. They are in a massive box of limitation because of their state of consciousness, if you would call it that, 
their state of awareness, their state of perception. So to control from their box, they have to put humans in a smaller box than they're in, and then they've got control. And this is what has happened with the suppression of knowledge, the suppression of, of uh, a real history, the suppression of scientific awareness, the suppression of all this stuff that would give us a fix on who we really are, and the immensity and genius and all uh, powerful uh, beings that we are in terms of our potential to create and to manifest what we want. That's all had to be kept from us, because if we are at that level of awareness, then we ain't going to be controlled by a, a, a bunch of pathetic, uh, deeply imbalanced uh, entities. So all that has to be shut down, and we have to believe that we are Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith. We have no power, we're just Joe Public. Who am I? I can't change anything. I use this analogy a lot because I think it fits. What we are experienced through our lifetimes in this reality, this time around, with all the rest of it, is not who we are. It is a deeply false, fake uh, position that we've been put in. And I symbolize it as the ball. The natural state of the ball in a tank of water is to float on the top. That's its natural state. And left to its own devices, left to express its natural state, that ball will float on the top of the tank. If you want to put it in an unnatural state, you have to push it on the bottom of the tank. But you can't then push it on the top, bottom of the tank and then leave it, because the moment you take your hand away, the ball will go to its natural state. Top of the tank again. So what you have to do to hold a ball in an unnatural state is to put it down there and bloody hold it there. Indefinitely. And that hand, symbolically, on the ball, is this explosion of manipulation, suppression, uh, mental, emotional, uh, electrochemical uh, imbalance, and programming of the body computer that bombards us from crazy. The reason they have to bombard us is because we are infinite consciousness and the potential of even the body computer to um, uh, connect into much vaster levels of awareness even within this virtual reality are massive compared with what we're actually experiencing. So they have to keep this on all the time. It's actually a confirmation of our true potential. How hard they have to work to keep us uh, in an unnatural state, i.e. in a state of mind and uh, closed mind and closed awareness. So, to escape from the box, I would say we need to use the knowledge of what put us in the box and reverse it. You know, we're not, we don't need solutions really. We need to remove the cause of the problem. And the cause of the problem is that we allow ourselves to be controlled in so many ways and we don't need to do that. And if we don't, then the, the problem is not solved by a solution, it's solved by removing the cause of the problem. First of all, and, and this I find is the first movement that really starts this process of moving out of the box. From what point do we observe, um, observe ourselves? If we observe ourselves as Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith, zoomf, we're in the box. Because we're identifying with being the body computer, being a name, being a job. Who are you? I'm Charlie Jones. I drive a bus. That's who I am. No, it's not your experience. Not who you are at all. But if we identify ourselves at that level, then we bring ourselves into a sense of limitation based on that self-identity. If, however, we move our point of observation from I am Ethel Jones and I drive a bus or whatever to I am infinite consciousness, all that is, has been and ever will be, having an experience in this now of being Ethel Jones driving a bus. It's not who I am, it's what I'm experiencing. This is not me, this is the vehicle for that experience. Immediately, it's what happened to me and it's happened to others, your point of observation moves from little me to all that is. And once that point of observation moves, you are moving from being in this world and of it 
to being in this world, experiencing it, but not being of it in terms of your point of observation of, of your own experience and that which goes on around you. Suddenly everything starts to move, everything starts to change. Just from that first readjustment of self-identity. From I am the reflection in the mirror to I am consciousness and my vehicle to experience this reality reflects in the mirror. Crucial to this movement of self-identity from little me to all that is, is to drop these primitive emotional responses which come from the reptilian brain. So, be afraid, be very afraid, the big monster's coming. And? Where's the reptilian brain there? Oh God! And? I'm all that is. Has been, ever will be. I don't, I'm not frightened of anything. Why would you be frightened? Why, why, what is there to be frightened of? Would consciousness be frightened of the big bag monster you're now inventing around your table? No. I am consciousness. I am not frightened of the big bad monster that you're in the process of inventing and trying to sell me as a big bad monster. Terrorism! Reptilian brain. In a picture. Reptilian brain. Ah! So. Terrorism! And? This mechanism has to go. These primitive emotional responses based on fear and based on um, reaction, not considered observation, that has to go. Because every time we react like that, we all do it. I'm not sitting cross-legged on a mountain saying, I'm the Buddha and I shall tell you how it's all done. You know, I go through life trying to understand more things, but I go through life also experiencing my own journey. I've got arthritis in my knees, I can't sit cross-legged anymore. I haven't done for ages, which is good. I can't be the Buddha. And so it, it affects us all. But once you start to realize how this works, you start then to notice your primitive emotional responses when the reptilian brain kicks in, and, and then you can override it. You can go, whoops, bit of rep brain there, sorry. That's all right, I notice it now. <sighs> Change. Bird flu and swine flu. The reaction. Actually, these, these masks don't work. But it makes me feel better, you know, it keeps this bit more quiet if I've got a mask. But um, again, the reaction comes from here and gets the desired response, which gets the desired uh, justification to push the agenda forward. If we want to take control of our reality back, we need to move to a point where we identify ourselves between being infinite conscious and having experience and we need to get this bugger under control. And we can do that by not reacting emotionally um, in the way that we are programmed to do, like sheep. You know, I, I've stood in England sometimes and I've watched vast numbers of sheep being controlled by one sheepdog, fear, and the shepherd on a stick, symbol of authority. If those sheep did not succumb to fear and to authority and just went off and expressed their uniqueness, that shepherd and that sheepdog would have not one hell of a chance of making those sheep go where they want them to go. It would be impossible. But because the sheep conform to authority and yield to fear, one sheepdog and one shepherd can get large numbers of sheep to go exactly where they want them to. That's how humanity is controlled and it's again through the reptilian brain. It's another thing. A sense of survival, a sense of security comes with most people, a lot, well, large numbers of people from being like everyone else. Being like everyone else is like a comfort zone for people. And people feel uncomfortable when they break out of the, uh, the herd. Lo lots of people do. Because in some way this is kicking in. Because it's, it's again a form of not surviving. That leaving the comfort zone which is living, believing and 
perceiving like, like the vast majority do. It all comes back to that. This is, this is, the, this is the, the God on the gate. And to break out of that, we need to become the maverick. Not become the maverick because, again, a self-identity, I'm the maverick, I'm going to be different for the sake of it. No. Following our own heart, following our own desire in terms of the, the, uh, the direction we want to go, the things we want to do and explore. And not denying and repressing that because it will take us out of the herd and, oh, what will your mother think? And, oh, what about the guys down the pub and the people at work and all that stuff? Being different, because being different is what happens when we express our uniqueness, we become different. Not different for the sake of it, different because we're different when we express our uniqueness and don't succumb to the herd mentality. This was a wonderful film, The Dead Poet Society, where Robin Williams um, was showing the, the boys in his class how to do this, how to, to, to think outside of the box. And he stood on his desk and he said, I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. You see, the world looks very different from up here. You don't believe me? Come and see it for yourselves. And the boys are there like, oh, stand on desk. We shouldn't stand on desk. It doesn't feel right standing on desk. And eventually they do, and they break out of this, this fear of, of, of not conforming. And we're now being offered the chances. This information and this understanding starts to come to light to break out of all these, uh, all these self-induced and externally engineered prisons breaking out of being in the herd and reconnecting to all that is. And when you do that, you start behaving in different ways and saying different things and having different views. And, and this has to be brought under control where it's not activating survival because you're being different. Because you're the governor of this, it's not the governor of you. And therefore, you can be different without the fear of the consequences. I went through incredible, breathtaking ridicule in Britain for years and years and years. And in the national media, I still do. Couldn't give a damn. This, do, this doesn't kick in anymore because I don't give a damn what people think of me. Why? Because they have a right to think what they like. You know, if they think I'm crazy, they have a right to think I'm crazy. Well, who am I to say that they shouldn't? It's called freedom. But I've reached a point, not because I'm a genius or something special, but purely through the experience of mass ridicule, eventually the waters broke where it didn't matter anymore. And the freedom that brings is indescribable. Where there's no mental gymnastics. How do I put this in a way that these people will think I'm sane? What do I leave out so these people will not think I'm crazy? Instead, open my mouth, say what I feel. People think I'm crazy. Well, that's their right. And it's my right to say what I like. Okay? So everyone's a winner. So... Another thing that is... I, I found, I'm talking about my own experiences here and the, the process I've been through. Another thing I've found is real, really important to go through this process of deprogramming uh, to consciousness. And what you're doing is you're not becoming conscious. We're all already bloody conscious. It's just that we're not accessing that level of ourselves because the mind is getting in the way. Instead of the mind being the vehicle for consciousness to experience this reality, mind has become the governor. It's like sitting next to your computer and the computer taking over and deciding where it goes on the internet and what it thinks of it. Well, you're sitting here banging the bloody keys and nothing's happening. The mind takes over. That's the idea of the genetic manipulation and it's the idea of all the other manipulation. What I think I've found is clearing my mind. I went through a process from 2007. I had massive changes in my life. I'd reached a point where the pressure of what I do had reached, had, had, had reached the point where I was becoming very badly physically ill. Um, I was becoming really overweight. Um, and, and I started to realize that the reason that, because I don't eat that much, not at all, but what I started to realize is actually what, when you take on massive emotional baggage, um, the body stores that emotional energetic poison 
where it is not going to affect the body and it stores it in fat. And if you haven't got enough fat, well, it produces fat to store it in. And so emotion um, it, it can actually manifest as, as, as physical weight in the body. It did with me. And I, um, great changes happened in my life because I knew that if this went on for a few more weeks or months, I wasn't going to be here. Uh, I was facing tremendous challenges to try and stop me what, I, what I'm doing and all the rest of it. And then I went through this process and it was like amazing. Um, I started to, first of all, have this uh, obsession with throwing out everything that I didn't need. And I only live in a little flat, but it's amazing how much rubbish that you don't need and will never use that actually builds up. And for weeks, literally, I was going down several times a week to the recycling tip with all this stuff and just dumping it. And dumping it and dumping it until eventually I had nothing left except that that I used every day and the one or two things uh, I, I maybe needed, but not much. This cupboard, which had all the rubbish in, empty. Empty. And then after that had finished, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm quite a clean person around the house, I like to keep things clean, but I'm not obsessive with it, but for about three weeks, I was cleaning every bloody thing. I was getting all the cleaners and all the polishes, and I was going around and I was cleaning every bloody thing. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? I've got to clean this. I've got to... And then I realized that what was happening was I was externalizing something that I started to realize was going on inside myself. All that emotional baggage, all that built up frustration and uh, stuff uh, was starting to dissolve. And as it did so, it externalized itself with me throwing out all the external uh, things around me, a baggage that I didn't need, and cleaning out the house, cleaning out myself is what I was doing. And I went through this process for about six months and vast amounts of this emotional baggage just fell from me um, and I lost weight, everything and I realized that we hold ourselves in servitude also by filling our minds with clutter that is completely irrelevant um, you know all this um, I, I love it now sometimes you know when I sit there quietly and I listen to my mind it's ever so much fun. It's hilarious. It's so stupid. Um, I sit there and I, my mind goes, and you, 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 your, your mind's going, it's thinking about a situation that's coming up. And it goes, and, and, and if he says this to me, I'll say this to him, and that's, then I'll say that to him and, and stuff. And if he says this, I'm going to do this. And, and, and then you, you, you laugh and you think, well, what do you mean? He ain't said that yet. <laughs> and he probably never will. And you're, you're feeling this. This whole drama, the mind loves drama. That's another reason why it likes to be frightened. It loves drama. <sighs> have, you heard about, have you heard about swine flu? Ooh, mind loves drama. That's why, that's why so many people love soaps on television and dramas, because the mind loves them. Consciousness doesn't do drama, you know. But mind, it loves it, right? So I started to see how all this mind clutter just gets in the way of becoming conscious and when you when you listen to your mind working and you observe it it's hilarious because like I said earlier you start to ask the question well who's observing my mind hey it's consciousness and you start to realize your mind really is a program that runs by itself um, if you if, if it takes control so clearing your mind is so so important and, and I'm saying this to myself because it's a constant process of, of, of cleaning out these things, these vestiges of, of clutter that uh, are still there. And this is one of the things that came to me, and I, you know, I still go through this myself and uh, work on it and realize it, it doesn't matter. Like I say, the mind loves drama, so to the mind everything bloody matters. Everything, because it loves drama. Do you, that, that woman, what she said to me in 1953, I've never forgotten it, ruined my bloody life, I've never forgotten her. Right, 1953, she's not alive anymore. And if she is, she's probably having a great time. You know, and here you are winding yourself up for what she said in 1953, it loves drama. And, oh, you know, oh, this, that, and the other, oh, that's terrible, I can do that, all the rest of it. And you go, I have this um, deathbed cleansing, you might call it. Look at a situation that's winding you up. 
and then say, again, primitive emotional responses, and then say, um, if I was on my deathbed now, with 10 minutes to live, would this matter? And if 99% of the time, these things that wind us up and activate this, pro this uh, reaction process of emotion, we'd say on the deathbed, nah, it didn't matter at all. The trick is to bring that forward here, or bring that into this now, and not let it matter now. Because as you become more and more conscious, and I still fall into it, we all do, but less and less and less and less. When you um, open to consciousness, more and more, I find myself going, it doesn't matter. My son must be get fed up with it. He keeps saying to me, what about this dad and all that stuff? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because it doesn't. The mind just makes it matter because it loves drama. And when we look at our lives, if we just take that deathbed point of observation, if I was on my deathbed now with 10 minutes to live, would this thing that's winding me up now matter? And the answer is no, well, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And as we um, withdraw from everything mattering, what we're actually doing is we're taking the power of mind away. All the time, every time we say some drama, doesn't matter. We're taking the power of the mind away to dictate our perception. Every time we are faced with a situation where the survival mechanism would normally kick in and go, ah, and we don't go, ah, we are taking the power of the reptilian brain away from our sense of perception all the time. And as we do that, we allow consciousness in. Taking responsibility is absolutely vital. Because what the system's always trying to do is get us to externalize responsibility because they know if we externalize it, then nothing will ever change. Because the real responsibility for the reality we're experiencing is here. So if we're looking there, this never changes. And again, it's, I keep coming back to it, to the point of boredom. When we externalize blame, again, it's the reptilian brain, survival. It, it's surviving a situation by responsibility for it, which other parts of the brain actually do. Um, and so we say, when we're in a situation we don't like, it's all your fault. I mean, you know, it could be suggested that I've said in the last six or seven hours, it's the reptilian's fault. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's our fault. It, our, it's not, not fault. It's not about fault. It's not about blame. But it's our responsibility. The few can only control the many if the many give their power away. We've made it possible. We can make it impossible by taking that power back. But when we externalize blame for things that are happening in our lives, then we are condemning ourselves to those things never changing because the source that's making them happen is not being addressed. I had a... Um, I had a letter once from a, a, a guy, and he said for 16 years, he'd been facing constantly this same decision in different forms and situations, and every time he took the same decision in response to it, and every time his life didn't change and went to another point where he had the same decision to make. After 16 years, when that situation came up again, he took the other decision. His life changed, it never repeated because he realized that he was creating it and therefore he chose to take responsibility for the fact that he was creating these things happening in his life he didn't like and by taking responsibility and making a different decision changing himself that recurring unpleasant experience stopped we are in control and will only change it by taking our control back and not blaming some other bugger um, Carl Jung People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. How, have you noticed? We all have done it in our lives. There's no kind of perfect beings uh, uh, here who've done everything right according to the book. And what is right and anything, is, you know, this, this right and wrong stuff, it's just uh, uh, objective, subjective rather. Um, but how many times when something has happened in our lives or something has happened in a situation do we work on ourselves the chatter to convince ourselves it wasn't our responsibility it wasn't our fault it wasn't us that made that happen why 
while if we say, yes, I'll take responsibility for that, by doing that, we make sure it doesn't happen again. We make sure we don't face that situation again as the cycle repeats itself. Taking responsibility is, is, is to, to look at self when something happens. Why is this happening to me and not her or him? Why me? Why me? Okay, I can see why it's happening to me. I can now change that part of me that's making that happen. It doesn't happen anymore. That's how we move on, by taking responsibility. Because taking responsibility can be said to be something else. Taking power back. Blaming someone else is giving power away. We are saying some people, uh, people out there have control over my life. When we say I'm taking responsibility for this and therefore I'm going to change it and change myself so it doesn't happen again, he's saying I have power over my life and, and experience, not someone else. It's the opposite of um, what we think it is. We mustn't uh, take responsibility because we don't want it to be our fault. It's not about fault, it's about power. And in the same way, we can moan about wars and quite rightly, which are kind of obviously uh, horrific with bombs dropping on civilian cities, but on another level, all the arguments and conflicts that we have among ourselves. I still have a few, but dramatically less than I ever did. Because it doesn't matter, comes in so often now. But if we stop conflicting among ourselves and, and also within ourselves, uh, heart and head, should I, shouldn't I, really want to do this, this is my duty though, all, this, all these conflicts within and between ourselves, then they wouldn't manifest collectively as wars, which is just a collective version of conflict and an extreme version of conflict, um, which is an expression of the conflict that's going on constantly within ourselves and between ourselves. Crikey, have you seen some husband and wives and families? bloody arguing and cussing and all the rest of it that goes on and then they go on peace marches you know we need to sort ourselves out and then the collective will take care of itself and also this idea and this is uh, again a uh, cognitive dissonance of you fight for something you fight for peace you fight to stop wars, you fight to stop globalization. When we fight something, when we, for instance, um, riot at protests and stuff like that, um, what we're doing is becoming what we are fighting. It's a simple uh, truth. What we fight, we become. You know, you see protest marches against something and there's a lot of the protest marches act just like the people that they're protesting against don't can't tell the difference between them and so the more we fight the more we become what we say we oppose if we need if we if we want to change something if we want peace we need to peace for peace not fight for peace you don't fight to stop war you are peaceful to stop war. Simple thing, if we want a peaceful world, we need to be peaceful. But how much peace do we have among ourselves and within ourselves to start with? So it always comes back to self. Finding peace within ourselves and between ourselves will manifest itself eventually collectively as peace between us all. It's these inner conflicts and inner wars that the Illuminati are constantly manipulating to keep us in a state of division within and without so that we um, are not in that harmonious state that can see beyond the illusion. Freedom fighters, I love it. Fighting for freedom. The reason so many... Uh, revolutions end up putting in governments just as bad or worse than the people they threw out is because if you if you create something out of violence and fighting then you create the manifestation of that afterwards in government back to cognitive dissonance fighting for freedom and then there's all this uh, within us this repression and denial again it comes from fear of expressing who we really are. 
expressing what we really think, living our lives as we see fit rather than as people tell us we should live our lives. So we repress, we deny what we want to do, we repress and deny our feelings, we repress and deny the fact that our belief systems actually don't stand up. And that creates tremendous turmoil. Again, it's about clearing the mind, clearing the energy field. By just saying, I'm getting rid of this clutter. And this clutter we call belief. I'm putting all belief on hold until I've looked at this again. I'm not clinging to belief as a sense of security. I'm saying all bets are off. I'm going to look at things anew. Clear out this belief. Clear out this, this is how it is. And I'm going to defend it till my knuckles turn white to all people at challenge it. Okay, my mind is open to all possibility. Let the evidence show me um, the way to go. Because so often we talk about wanting truth, but we just don't look where it is. Science does this. He won't look where the truth of reality really is because he doesn't want to find it collectively. Medicine will not look where true healing lies because he doesn't want to find it because the moment it does, this old edifice of drug and scalpel medicine collapses. People with rigid belief systems don't want to find the truth because their belief systems uh, had it over, finished, finito. Don't want it. But we want the truth, we're just not going to look where it is. Another externalization of our power is I'm unlucky. I'm unlucky. Why does it always happen to me? Good question. Why does it always happen to you and not happen to this person here? Ever thought of looking here to find a common denominator about why it's always happening to you? No, we're not going to go there because we're not taking responsibility. It's unlucky. I've got I've had bad luck. No such thing as bad luck. There's creating reality. There's decoding reality to experience certain things. Nothing to do with bad luck. It's our inner state externally manifested. And if we take responsibility for that, like I say, and say, say it's bad luck, I'm always so unlucky, then we can change what experience but if we keep saying I'm unlucky we'll go on being unlucky we won't be but we'll still convince ourselves that we are you know it's kind of funny when you watch watch, watch football there's certain teams at certain times that always seem to score a last-minute goal over and over and over in a season and they, they, they say, say it's uh, Arsenal in England they say bloody Arsenal lucky always scoring a last-minute goal. Manchester United have done it a lot um, in the last few months. Uh, it's not luck at all. It's the collective state of being of the players expressing itself externally, and that mental and emotional state of that collective mind we call a team is in a state where it is manifesting the fact that it wins over and over, even if it's in the last minute. Other teams who have a different collective, individual and collective state of being, state of perception, they're always losing last minute goals. Oh, we're so, that team's so unlucky, lucky they lost another go game in the last minute. Oh, that's five. It's not luck. It's perception manifested as experience. So, this reality is like a screen, like a movie screen, this physical reality, this, this decoded reality we call physical. And by the time it hits the screen, by the time it comes here as an experience, it's a bloody done deal. That's why the Illuminati love it if we try to change this world, holographic, quote, physical world, out here in the illusory holographic physical world, because they know we ain't going to change bugger all. What it's, what it's like, absolutely like, is standing in a theater, and because we don't like the movie, we shout at the screen. Change the movie, I don't like this. Give me a banner. Stop globalization. You're not going to change the movie by screaming at the screen. You've got to go to the back of the theater and change the bloody reel, because this is just a projection. And this is just a projection. And we run around 
trying to change a projection within the projection. No chance ever. We need to look within to what is projecting this. And that's beyond the holographic level, down through the electrical and digital level, into the vibrational level of inner being. Awareness, energy. When we change that by going within ourselves, rather than going that way, then the vibrational change we make as a result of that becomes electrical change, becomes decoded change, becomes changed experience on the screen we call the physical world, which is in here, of course. We're looking in the wrong direction and we have been manipulated to look in the wrong direction. It's what I call combing the mirror. You don't like your hair, what do you do? You don't comb the mirror, do you? You don't comb the mirror. You, what are you doing combing the mirror? It's got to change your hair, is it? But that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing all the time, day after day. We're combing the bloody mirror by trying to change out here, out here, when out here is just a done deal reflection of in here. If you want to uh, comb your hair, um, change your hair, you comb your hair and the mirror reflects it. That's exactly the principle of taking responsibility and saying what is it within me and my mental and emotional state, my perception that is projecting out from the vibrational through to the decoded uh, holographic physical, this bloody experience that I'm having. Change that, that must change. But we comb the mirror and therefore nothing can change. I think I read somewhere that something, uh, somebody's suggesting now that something like 2% of the decisions we make come from the conscious mind and the rest come from the subconscious within, beyond what we call a conscious awareness. Although actually it's mind awareness in most people, not conscious awareness. I would go further than that, I would say 100% of decisions, actions that take place within this holographic physical reality come from uh, within, not from the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the observer of experience, it is the experiencer, but it is not the origin of the behavioral uh, and uh, responses that we appear to take within this reality. They all come from a deep subconscious level and out through the decoding system into this level of projection, this movie screen, and at that point it's a done deal. It's just the movie hitting the screen. So it's within that we need to find the answers. One of the things that's been coming out in recent years is this law of attraction. I think it's been a bit simplified uh, myself, but it's the idea, and there's a hell of a lot of truth in it, that um, what you put out, you attract towards you. Um, now, what's interesting is, uh, given what I've just said, is it's not my physical holographic illusory body that attracts in other people, experiences, locations uh, that we are attracted to and come into our lives. It is the vibrational level of me that connect with other vibrational fields we call people, places, ways of life, experiences and we draw them into our lives. That's the level it happens on. And then as we draw those energy fields in, those energy fields are decoded by our five senses into uh, electrical signals and then we decode the vibrational fields through the electrical into this person coming into our life called Mary Jones or something um, from, I don't know, down the street or wherever. So when we're talking about the law of attraction, again, that law of attraction is at a deep vibrational level of reality, not on this so-called physical level. So again, what we are, what's happening on those deep uh, vibrational levels of being, or what is attracting our experience and people in. So again, that's what we need to change if we're going to change what we draw in. It's no good trying to change it by looking out here. Uh, and drawing in uh, people that way. The law of attraction is, is what draws in vibrationally and then becomes holographic. 
the people, places, jobs, opportunities or lack of opportunities or why is this person so unlucky that he turned up just right for this to happen and I turned up over here five minutes late and I didn't get that because of this, that and the other. Why, why is he lucky and why is his life synchronistic and mine never seems to come together, there's always something going wrong because at some vibrational level we're not sinking so, so our external life won't sink. It's all happening, vibrational level is what we need to get to what we call subconscious and deep levels of being. This is just an illusory screen, like I say. If we um, are on a, a, uh, a vibrational level, we have some kind of fear, then we will draw in, through what I call vibrational magnetism, um, energy fields that sync with that fear. And it will be an expression of that fear often. So, um, when I was... Um, when I was a kid, I was frightened of dogs. And my mates weren't frightened of dogs. When we walked through the park, dogs came from all directions, started jumping up, they took bit out my coat and everything. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm so unlucky. They're not frightened of dogs and the dogs never go near them. I'm frightened of dogs and they always come for me. Why am I so unlucky? No, I was putting out some vibrational fear of dogs, the dogs were picking it up on a vibrational level and were being attracted to me to cause me hassle. When I let go of my fear of dogs, dogs never came near me again. And that's a simple example of what's happening to us in all areas of our lives. You'll never guess, you know I've always been frightened of so and so, it's only happened. Well what does it happen to you and not to him? Because you drew it in. These are the levels where if we don't take responsibility for them, we'll stay in the box. It's the same with love. If we put love out, I mean true uh, love, and it's it, within this reality, in this mind-made construct, it is real challenge to, to get to that level of love that is beyond individual love to love of all. But when we get to those levels, you start to draw in expressions of that, and your life starts to change as a result of that. And one of the key energies for me that we put out that will change everything is intent. Some people call it the will. It's when not an intellectual, I want to do this, or I want to be spiritual, that's it, but I want to be the full magnitude of to be the full magnitude of who I am. I want to become consciously aware of who I am and my true power and infinite nature and I will do anything necessary to make that happen. When you put out that intent and you mean it, it's not just a trite phrase, then you start to draw in what you need to create that intent every time. Um, but we have this belief when we do this, this put out this power of intent. Um, because, I'll give you an example, when I started to realize nearly 20 years ago now that the world wasn't like I thought it was, well not what I thought it was, I didn't really think about it much, but it wasn't like I perceived it to be, and everyone perceived it to be, I put out the intent, because I was fascinated by it, I want to know wh what it's all about, and I will do what is necessary to find out what it's all about. I'm going to do this, and what happens is, you start to, that intent starts to draw towards you what you need to achieve that intent. Now, what you think is when you put out the intent, I want to be spiritual, then everything kind of becomes beautiful and nymphs fly around you and butterflies and stuff and everything falls into place and there are bright colors and country lanes with angels playing violins and harps and it's all spiritual now. And when you put out the intent, I want to know what's going on, I want to know the, 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 the bigger truth of everything, you think that, you know, people are going to come along and just hand it to you. What actually happens is all hell breaks loose in your life, often. It bloody broke loose in mine. And at, so, at this point, so many people stop on this journey of awakening to the true magnitude of who they are because they see things coming towards them where their old life starts to break down, 
relationships might start to break up, they lose this job, uh, they might lose financial security, I certainly bloody did, um, and suddenly you think, no, no, something's going wrong here, this can't be right, I want to be spiritual now. But what is happening, and if, if we only realize that, it, what's happening, it would be so much easier. We are putting out a vibrational expression of our inner state of being. That manifests itself as what we call our life. The people in it, the relationships in it, the jobs, the locations, the opportunities, the lifestyle. When you say, okay, I want to transform, I want to know the big picture, I want to be spiritual now, then intent doesn't say, uh, okay, uh, cue nymphs, cue angels with harps, that guy over there, okay? What it says is, here's what you need to achieve that. And because we live in a mind-made world, constructed by mind-made domination and perception, if we want what we say we want, that has to break down. Otherwise, it's going to stop us getting where we say we want to go forever bloody more. So what intent then does is bring to us pains in the backside, people we wish we'd never met, losing your job, Losing financial security, maybe a relationship breaking down, it doesn't always happen like this. It depends what you need to break down this construct to allow the real self in. And what happens to large numbers of people, often because they don't understand that, this, and I bloody know what it's like because I didn't understand it when I went through the first part of this. They say, okay... I'd like to know the truth and I'd like to be spiritual, okay? But not that bloody badly. No thank you. And they walk away. And they say, see, you don't create your own reality. I wanted to do that, but on my help, my, my life fell apart. No, your life was falling apart because your intent was breaking down the energetic construct that had manifested in what you call your life. And because that has to go before that can come in, you were in the process of transforming. You were in the, the most challenging part of the process of transforming, but that's what you were in. And because I, I'm a uh, stubborn bugger, me, um, and I'm, I don't like uh, giving up, um, I kept with it, and eventually the waters broke. And I realized that what would, hap what would have been happening through those nightmare years of mass ridicule and mass rejection and all the other stuff was that that construct that was holding me in the illusion was being broken down. And you know, I came up with this phrase which, which is so applicable to my life. Life gives you your greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as your worst nightmare. And only when you go beyond it and you see what that gave you with hindsight do you realize this nightmare was actually your greatest gift because it was breaking down the prison that has now set you free. And this again kicks in when this process is going on. Oh no, survival! Survival of... Uh, survival of your uh, reputation! What will people think of you? Oh my God! And when you don't give in to that and you go through it, bingo, the promised land. The secret, this thing that, uh, this, this DVD that talked about what you put out, you get back and if you uh, focus on wanting a Ferrari and visualize it, then you'll create it. Well, maybe you will, but we have life experiences and if your life experience does not involve a Ferrari, then you can paint your house with Ferraris and focus on them all day. They ain't coming. Um, it's not that simple. And again, like I say, why me? Why me? Exactly. Why you? Why are you creating that experience and not someone else? Change what's attracting it, the experience will disappear. And there are so many influences that are um, affecting our reality, uh, astrological influences, which, is ju which are just energetic uh, uh, fields affecting our own energetic field, uh, the life experience that we came to experience, uh, the way we decode reality, all these things are deciding what our lives are. But 
We can have control over all of them if we become conscious and allow consciousness to be the governor of our experience and not mind. And that means living life instead of life living us. Most people on this planet go through their three score years and ten having life, the program, live them. They just follow the program thinking they're making the decisions but all they're doing is going round and round on the carousel absolutely convinced that one day they'll uh, catch up with a horse in front but they never do and if we got off the carousel and started living life instead of letting life live us then we'll have a totally different experience and crucial to breaking out of this prison is breaking down this uh, density, this solidity we call mind and opening it up to all possibility the ocean so that we can be in this world but not of it and the process in the matrix kind of sums up brilliantly what happens when you start on this journey stage one is to accept that we are in a situation of slavery because only when we accept that do we start to see the bars of the prison and therefore realize there's something to be addressed here if we don't even go as far as seeing that we're in slavery to this system then we don't see the bars we do nothing about it we go round and round and round until we hit the coffin and away we bloody go so admitting not admitting but becoming aware that we're in a state of slavery stage two choosing freedom above slavery and that means going through these processes I've just been talking about of breaking down and transforming from the construct of mind that we had to a mind that is much more fluid and connected to consciousness which we call transformation and that symbolic very difficult transformation that the Neo character went through of course Neo being an anagram for one um, was very very symbolic of the challenges that we go through in our lives experience self is breaking down the program self is breaking down and the conscious self is starting to emerge the one the oneness my god I've been in that position a few times I've, I've gone on to the top of hills in England away from everybody so I couldn't cause anybody any trouble and I have screamed primordial screams of frustration just to get it out trying to bang my head against a wall when at the time it seemed no one would listen it's changed now but I've been there so many times but the more and especially since I went through that process of letting it go doesn't matter I don't do that anymore I haven't screamed for years because <laughs> I haven't felt necessity to scream because the frustration is not there like it was because of the construct that produced that frustration has broken down and we can move to this place as we open up from mind domination which we find so difficult to perceive you know I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that of this cosmic level of love where we love everything and everyone why because they are because everything and everyone that is is what we are the divisions between us of race and sex and politics and religion are all illusions we are one consciousness having an experience and when we hurt another expression of consciousness we're just attacking ourselves without realizing it love is not something you're in it's something you are the delusion this delusion is a kind of prison for us 
restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us, our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in all its beauty. That's consciousness, not mind. Infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. Infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. All possibility, the silent, no thing, everything, is infinite love. And that is the only truth. Everything else we call creation and form is illusion. Creations of the imagination and the all-knowing, all-potential of infinite love. The silent, all-knowing, all possibility, no thing, everything. That's what we ultimately are. But we are aware, our awareness is now experiencing this realm of form. And it's just an experience. Everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and everyone who was around me, I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. That is who we are. Where is Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith? Where are they? Now, if we can take that level of our self and observe our life experience from that point of view instead of being near oh my god then everything changes and suddenly fewer and fewer things matter this gets activated less and less and suddenly consciousness starts to take over rather than mind we start to access our true identity and live it instead of the false identity, know thyself. Don't think you are, know you are. That's another point. The mind thinks, but thought is a very low level of perception and communication. Knowing is the communication of consciousness, a knowing you can't put words to, you just know. Why do you know you've got to be at so-and-so's tomorrow morning? Explain it to me. Mind wants an explanation. You can't just know. You must know why. No. I just know. I don't have to think. I don't have to explain it. I just know. That's consciousness. What we call intuition. That's consciousness. And when you open to consciousness, your life starts to work like that. You know, when somebody asks me if I want to, uh, if I want to talk, I, um, in a place, I ask very few questions. I should, because uh, some I might end up in a disaster but my intuition said yes go with that and somebody might offer me something that appears good and my mind goes oh yeah that sounds good no 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 I don't do it and it's amazing how it works out and after a while the war stops when you follow your intuition because at the start again the survival mechanism kicks in and the bloody left brain you can't do that you can't just say I know and go somewhere you must have to explanation for it and all oh, you must plan and do the triplicate and um, and then after a while, although going with your intuition gets you into some scrapes uh, in terms of you do things differently to the norm, and when you face those scrapes, the old head comes in and goes, see, told you, you don't listen to me, see. Uh, then after a while, the mind observes that when you follow this, even though you have some challenges, it works out in the end, not despite the challenges but because of them which led to that and after a while your mind and your intuitive knowing come together and the war ends and you start to intuitively know and think the same and it's an extraordinary feeling like two halves of you coming together and speaking as one speaking as one and when we uh, start to make this transition from mind domination we start to break up the mind-made world and crucially the mind-made conspiracy and we have system failure 
And there's no question after uh, 20 years of 50 countries and year after year that there is a shift taking place. People have talked about a shift and how there is an energetic shift. People have talked about 2012. I'm not really with them on that, but a shift, absolutely. Uh, there's an energetic change. I, um, I wrote a book, the first book I ever wrote after I had my, you know, top of my head blew off and I didn't even know my name for about three months, uh, in 1990. I wrote this book called Truth Vibrations. And the reason I call it Truth Vibrations is I became aware in this transitional period when I was getting concepts and things I never understood. I, was, I learned that in various ways that there was a, a vibrational change coming. This is 1990. And it was going to awaken humanity from its amnesia, its hypnotic state. And this vibrational change was going to work like a spiritual alarm clock and it was going to break up this density we call the mind construct. And that's why I called that book in 1990, it came out in 91, Truth Vibrations. The vibrations that were going to awaken us to the truth. And another thing that it said, kind of amazing given what's happening now, is that this energetic change was going to bring to the surface all that had been hidden. And people were going to see what had really been happening what, what had in this world when they had no idea. And what's happening now, the hidden is becoming up to the surface. And um, I've seen, and as this change happens and we tune into it, amazing things happen to us. We're moving more and more people from this perception of division and apartness, left brain, uh, mind uh, made uh, perception, to a, an understanding of oneness that we're all one, like Jill Balty Taylor experienced when she got literally out of her head, or left side of it anyway. And I've seen, when I got this information about this vibrational change, there was no bloody evidence to support it in any way, shape, or form. None at all. I mean, far from kind of awakening to it, I was being hit by mass abuse in Britain for what I was saying but over the last 20 years my god I've seen it and it's an exponential curve and people are now waking up spontaneously and just getting it like how do they get it so fast because they're awakening to this truth vibration this, this truth vibration this energetic change that we're experiencing and I'm beginning to understand more and more is the reason this conspiracy is running almost panic-stricken to put the lid on through microchipping people and surveillance and control and all the rest of it is to put the lid on because they know this is coming and they knew it's been coming and that's why now they're suddenly going really uh, as fast as they can to create this prison world to shut people down as this truth vibration starts to wake them up and to break up this schism, bring back the vibrational harmony and bring us back to the kind of world we used to have when we were in harmony with each other, with self and with all existence. Now there's this thing coming up 2012 and people talk about 2012 and vibrational change. Now, Given what I've just said and what I wrote uh, 20 years ago, I should be saying, yeah, see, supports what I said. I don't, I don't go with 2012 me. I think it's overplayed. I think uh, there's a lot more to know about it, and I think it's a diversion. But is there a vibrational change? My God, there is. And I, um, yeah, nearly there. I, um, I don't go in for this channeling stuff very much, um, but because there are some people who can open their consciousness, open their mind, and access high levels of uh, consciousness, reality, dimensions, whatever you want to call them, and bring down that information into this reality to give you a real big, uh, greater awareness of this. But there are others who claim to be channels and that stuff who are actually channeling their own bloody mind and filling it with their own belief systems and all the rest of it. So you have to be very careful. 
Uh, and I don't go in for that much, but uh, you get someone who's good and um, really out there, and it can be tremendous stuff. Well, in 1990, just after I had this awakening, or was in the process of it, I got introduced to this lady. I met her twice. And she used to channel this uh, entity, which I had the name Magnu. It doesn't matter. It's just a name for a consciousness. And I was new to all this stuff, uh, what's happening to my life, and that I couldn't work it out. But I'm, I, I saw this woman. A friend of mine took me to see her because she said, oh, she's brilliant and that stuff. And if people don't believe in shape-shifting, they should see this woman. She kind of sat there, and um, we had a chat, and she said, well, it's a woman having a chat. And then she goes into this channel mode. Bloody face completely changed. I'm all new to this. I'm thinking, bloody hell, what's going on? And oh, what a change. And the voice was just incredibly different. But a face, I'll never forget it. It just completely changed and transformed. And what she said, I recorded it, and I, I wrote it down, and I've kept it ever since. Uh, 20 years now, nearly, tw uh, 19 anyway. And my goodness me, has it um, kind of spanned the years and uh, held its credibility for me. This is what this entity said in 1990, when there was no sign of it, except for a few. I feel you are sensing now the energies coming in, the energies surrounding your planet. This is causing many of you to ask questions. It is causing many of you to reevaluate completely your way of life, where you feel you wish to go, what you want to do. It is causing tremendous upheavals. Some of these upheavals are very confusing, very distressing, very disturbing. Some people in partnerships are finding they can no longer continue in those partnerships because their partners cannot tune in to what they are tuning into. It is causing a great deal of disturbance. And I have said to this sensitive um, on more than one occasion that you must organize yourself into groups to support each other. Now then, my own allegiance with your planet goes back to an Atlantean period when there were many energies being used and information and knowledge being used which were, for particular reasons of safety, withdrawn, shall we say, to prevent complete catastrophe, to prevent total destruction of your planet. Here we are now coming back to where we all started this, uh, or talked about a long time ago, part Atlantis. One could say that these were sort of emergency measures, if you like, to prevent the inhabitants of this planet from an untimely destruction. This is the energetic schism I've been on about. Now, at that time, shall we say, this knowledge was distributed only to the few. It was taught in what might, you might call a temple setting, though I am very careful about using this word. It has connotations, maybe. So let me use that word in the broadest possible sense. There were those initiated into this knowledge, there were grades of initiation, and those who passed the full initiation, these were known as the guardians of the light and keepers of the secret knowledge. This is the context from which I am coming. There came a time when this knowledge and the energies were withdrawn. It is very difficult for me to explain to you precisely uh, what I mean by that, so I will let you mull these things over. As the energies around your planet quicken, these latent energies, these energies which have been withdrawn, will now be phased back in. They will gradually be awakened. As the consciousness level of your planet raises itself, those of you light workers who are working together to raise your consciousness, you will be able to hold more and more refined vibrations, and so you, we will be able to use you as a catalyst to be able to feed in more and more um, energies. Now, of course, for energies that are not of this frequency to come in to affect this frequency, they have to be grounded through vehicles that are of this frequency so they, are, they, become, uh, they access this frequency uh, range and start to affect it. Otherwise, it's just never the twain shall meet. As more of you raise yourselves to meet the challenge, so we can awaken more of these energies. Now energy is consciousness and the energies themselves contain knowledge and the information which is beginning to service again in your consciousness so that many of you will remember Atlantean times. You will remember that you communicated with say dolphins and whales. You understood these other sentient creatures. You could levitate, you could manifest things, 
You could cause spontaneous combustion by not miraculous means at all. Once you know what you're doing, these things follow. It's a matter of order. Now I am looking at a time on your planet when these energies, this knowledge is reawakened and reintegrated into your consciousness. I'm not looking at a time when this knowledge will be for the few, but when your whole planet will be awakened to this understanding which you have simply forgotten. It's not a matter of new information, it's a matter of remembering who you are and where you come from. So you're being asked to change. You're being asked to change in a total way. It's not a matter of small changes, of a little thing here, a little thing there. You are really being asked to turn yourselves inside out. There is a massive shadow which must be cleared, and it is up to light workers such as yourselves to focus yourself on that challenge. Remember, this was nearly 20 years ago now. Those of you who are in the forefront of this, you are rather like a snowplow. You are the thin end of the wedge. You really have, how shall I put this, to a certain extent, I suppose, you have the shitty end of the job. You have an awful lot to do, but nevertheless, you are capable of doing an awful lot. That's why you've chosen to come. That is why you are here, and what you are here for, to really shovel some shit, and therefore make some space behind you to make it easier for the others. As in your human body, there are energy lines around your planet, through your planet, which correspond, I suppose, very much to the acupuncture lines and meridians in your body. Where two lines cross, you create a vortex, a tiny vortex if it's two. The more lines that intersect, the bigger the vortex. Therefore, you, when you have a chakra, you have a large vortex of intersecting energy. It is the same with your planet. Where the most lines cross, there is the biggest vortex. Now you could say the plexus in and around the islands you call the British Isles is the hub of the wheel of plexuses and energies which surround your planet. It has acted in other times like a fail-safe device. In order to activate these chakra points upon your planet, the energies must pass through the central point. They must pass through the heart of the pattern. And that is a key reason why the Illuminati have focused so much of their attention and location upon the British Isles. They um, are trying to control the heart of the pattern. This is why you have more stone circles, standing stones, per square mile in Britain, um, especially down the west coast uh, and in, in uh, Ireland, and in, in uh, Ireland, uh, anywhere else in the world per square mile. It's because of this energy plexus which they knew about, and people like the Druids knew about, and all the rest of it. And so this energetic change is there to, um, and also there are changes going on in the sun, which, are, which scientists are finding very strange, like these sunspots are staying in a low state much longer than um, they are, it were expected to. But this energetic change is, is, is coming at a time when um, it's offering us the opportunity to break out of this prison that's been created, this false reality um, that uh, came after this schism, which is now being corrected. Uh, it may not seem like it, but it is being corrected. Now we can, again, we're coming back to things I said earlier, a few uh, minutes or so ago, we can flow with this change and go with it and be at peace with it and take all the wonderful things it gives us as our awareness expands and our lives change, or we can fight it. We can stand there trying to hold on to the status quo. That's what the Illuminati are trying to do and this whole construct, trying to hold back from this energetic change. And eventually you're, you're, you're using more and more energy just to hold the status quo, and eventually this energetic uh, change will wash them away or wash us away if we don't flow with it, this, this energetic change which is changing the way we decode reality. And what it's doing, again it doesn't seem like it because uh, as we look at the news, but the news tells a fraction of the story, is that we're in the process of seeing this construct represented by this uh, Neil Haig symbolic image, this construct of the system breaking up and the time loop breaking out. So we then become the beings we were, or humans were, before the schism. 
where we were in harmony with self, in harmony with each other, and in harmony with all that is. And the schism has been so profound, we find it so difficult to even consider or imagine what that kind of life must be because of what the schism and the genetic manipulation has done to our perception of reality. So we're at a time to choose. We're at that crossroads. As Voltaire said, so long as people do not care to exercise their freedom, those who wish to tyrannize will do so, for tyrants are active and ardent and will devote themselves in the name of any number of gods, religious and otherwise, to put shackles on sleeping men. The answer to that, wake up. Cease to become sleeping men, women and children. And, and, and to those who say, well, yeah, I'm going to find an excuse, why not? Well, if we think this manipulation has... Uh, reached a uh, rather concerning level, then what are our children and grandchildren going to face? Look them in the eye and say, uh, what, what, what were you doing, mummy, daddy, granddad, grandma, when the fascist state came in that controls every area of my life? I was watching a game show, honey. It was ever so good, she was going for the car. Oh, well, I was a policeman. I was helping to introduce it, dear. Oh, I was a man in a dark suit. I didn't know what I was doing, honest. We're going to have some very difficult conversations and diverting our eyes from our children and grandchildren if they ask that question a few years from now <clears throat> if we just sit around and do nothing we have the crossroads it's between the head fear survival I can do nothing I'm little me heart consciousness I'm infinite consciousness having an experience and there's a great it's a great line in an old 60s song I think it was um, in America Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. It's amazing how you become free when you've got nothing left to lose. Because people have things. You see these people have lots of things and they have lots of money and all that stuff. But they're not free because they're attached to the things and they fear losing them. So they've, they've lost their ability to be free. And it's really when you've got nothing left to lose or your perception of nothing left to lose, that's when you become free and you start to express the real you. All the time people can... Uh, put off challenging authority and put off challenging authority and put off challenging authority until authority is at the door and they've got nothing left to lose and then nothing left to lose now I can challenge authority and you know we've, we've got great challenges but those challenges are simply the old construct breaking down so that this real us can come forward um, I saw this uh, proverb, just when the caterpillar thought life was over, it became a butterfly. Just when you think, every, I mean, I can talk about my own experience. I reached a point in 2007 when I thought what I was doing was all over and I thought there was nothing more that I could do. I thought, that's it, I've given it my best shot. And just at that point, I thought it was all over. Things were happening which have made it more incredible than ever I thought it could be. Because just when I thought life was over, my life became a butterfly. And that's the same with all of us, because it was just when I thought life was over and I couldn't go anymore, that is when um, the old construct finally broke down and the new one could come in with great power and it's transformed my life. So, um, I'm waking up, what can I do now? Well, the greatest thing is we can do is to stop making excuses. People, are, the mind is brilliant at excuses and providing all the reasons why we should do nothing and why we can justify to ourselves doing nothing because of course there's nothing I can do. Goes round and round and round. If we don't want to be in this state, then no more excuses. And the greatest thing that humanity can do is get off its bloody knees. We find so many reasons to get on our bloody knees. Thank God I've got arthritis, I can't get down there anymore. What are you doing down there? Your infinite consciousness, all that is, has been, ever will be, having an experience, oh no! On our knees to money, on our knees to religion, on our knees to everything. As Martin Luther King said, a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. One thing we could do, and support young people in doing it, is refuse to join the bloody military. 
refused to join the military. What they said in the 60s, what if they, what if they um, uh, started a war and no one turned up? There can't be any war because it's the silly buggers that fight the wars on behalf of those that uh, call and start the wars but never fight them. As Einstein said, the pioneers of a warless world are the youth who refuse military service. And if the youth refuse military service and older people support them, so they're going, no, oh, no, can't do that, serve your country. Then we can bring an end to so much conflict by simply refusing to take part in it. Oh, it, you know, it's funny how soldiers have the courage, physical courage, to go and put their lives at risk, but then they have the moral courage, often, some do, to actually uh, confront authority. They find that much more difficult than going and putting their physical lives at risk. And instead of going on protest marches, the system doesn't mind that. Uh, because what are they doing? Holding a banner up to the bloody uh, done deal projection on the screen. The system doesn't mind protest marches. If they get out of hand, and a lot of agent provocateurs make sure they do, then they've got more excuses to bring in the police state because we've got to keep these marches under control. In many ways, they're like steam whistles, as I call them. They let people let off steam so it doesn't go too far, and, and then they go home and they think feel good about themselves because they've had a protest march, but nothing's bloody changed. We've had protest marches about war and globalization and endless things. Wars go on, globalization gets ever faster. What the system is terrified of is us coming together and ceasing to cooperate with our own enslavement. It's terrified of that. But this is why it works so hard to divide and rule us so we never come together and cooperate or cease to cooperate in our own enslavement. As Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we come together and support and challenge the injustice of each other, even though that injustice doesn't immediately affect us, then we, we have a unity where we can make a difference. But when we're saying, oh no, that's his problem, not mine. Oh, that's his problem, not mine. Well, eventually it becomes your problem. If we don't support the injustice of others, eventually the injustice finds you. It's like that guy, Pastor Neomoller in Germany, who said, first they came for the uh, Jews, and I was not a Jew, so I did nothing. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I was not a trade unionist, so I did nothing. Then they came for the communists, and I was not a communist, communist, and I was not a communist, so I did nothing. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. So what they're doing now is picking off different sections of society, like Muslims and others. And, and as they pick them off, and other people are saying, well, it's not my problem, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a so-and-so, I'm not so-and-so. And then they pick more off and pick more off. And now, you know, people who thought that uh, they were uh, not subject to imposition and police states like the middle class in Britain are now going, hold on a second, this starting to impinge on me. Exactly. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. It's time to come together. Um, strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from an indomitable will. And my goodness me, we need that now. And what is there to fear anyway? When you move that point of observation from little me to all that is, what is there to fear? What is there to fear about authority? What is the fear about someone in uniform? Okay, you know, so they do this, so they do that. So we leave this reality a few years early, one or two. Well, we're all that is. It's just an experience. Will we feel better about having try to make a difference or we will feel better if we acquiesce and keep our heads down and yes sir, no sir, so we keep going a little bit longer and then we leave this reality which we're all going to do anyway, will we feel good about what we did then? Or will we feel good about saying no, I'm standing for what I believe in and I'm not backing off just because you're trying to intimidate me. Comply. This is the pyramid of power and what do we notice? We, silly sods, are the ones holding it up. You ever notice the pyramid? The top doesn't hold the bottom up, the bottom holds the top up. And we stand there with our acquiescence and with our fear of 
challenging authority with our fear of being different and we hold this whole edifice of power up and then we moan about not being free. And if a few people walked out of that pyramid, sorry mate, not doing this anymore. It's the intimidation and the manipulation that keeps us holding this whole thing together. Because this edifice of power is a house of cards and it depends on us holding the cards together. That's why those at the top of this house of cards are so terrified of us waking up and coming together and ceasing to be, um, uh, ceasing to take part in our own enslavement. Because once we do that, we walk away from the house of cards and the house of cards collapses. So, I said this in America a few weeks ago. There are hundreds of thousands of people having their houses foreclosed because they've lost their jobs as a result of the banking uh, abomination and greed. And now the banks who created the problem which led to the people losing their jobs so they can't pay their mortgage are now coming to taking their house away. And you know what? They're packing their bags and leaving. I say, what the hell are you doing? What the hell are you doing? If you acquiesce to that injustice, then the system wins every time. But if in large numbers, people in America, these hundreds of thousands of people losing their bloody jobs every month or so, said, we're not moving. The system couldn't cope with that level of foreclosures that would not move. And what if the neighbors um, helped them out? Suddenly the system can't cope because the people are coming together and they're saying, no, we are not accepting this. This is injustice. That's what we need to protect in justice. Not laws that are unjust. If we believe that when a law is passed you have to obey it, then okay, here's me wrists. Put the bloody chains on. Because there's no point. There's no way out of this. Men in dark suits pass laws, introduce laws. Oh, I've had no say in that law. I don't agree with it. I think it's really unjust, but it's the law, so I have to obey it. Yeah, there you go, put the chains on. Let's all go home. Waste of time. What we need to do is say not the law is there, so we need to obey it. Is that law just? Is that law fair? Does that law justify itself? in terms of those criteria. If no, I ain't doing it. And foreclosing on people and throwing them out of their homes when the people who are throwing them out of their homes are responsible for the fact that they can't pay the mortgage and therefore get thrown out of their homes, that's fundamental grotesque injustice. What are we doing walking away? What about that, that thing with wheelie bins I talked about earlier? 250 quid for putting a wheelie bin out on the wrong day. And people go, oh, it's terrible. What's the world coming to? Okay. Thousands of you in the same area this week all put your wheelie bins out two days before the wrong bloody day. Thousands of you. Okay, local council, sort that little lot out. And you know next week the same's happening. And the next, and the next, until you stop doing this ridiculous fining of people for this situation. That's just a simple example. We had a thing in Britain a few years ago, back in the 80s actually, more than a few years, called the poll tax, interview, introduced by Margaret Thatcher, where rich and poor had to pay the same. Ridiculous. And because, crucially, it affected what we call the middle class and the working class in Britain, so that divide, which normally means that's not my problem, that's not my problem, has gone. There was a unity of response. Large numbers of people said, this is unjust, we're not paying it. Some of them went to jail for a few weeks, most of them did not. And what happened? Because the system couldn't cope with we're not paying on that scale, the poll tax had to go and it was fundamentally in actually removing Margaret Thatcher from office. The non-comply dance, refusing to comply with our own enslavement. And you know, I was saying the other day, there's this wonderful line, necessity is the mother of invention. And if we just focus on the fact that we need to find the weakest points in the system where we cease to comply to bring the system down and under our control instead of it controlling us, 
then the mother of invention from that focus will find phenomenally creative ways 